Hello and welcome back everyone we weep online and today I'm gonna continue the story what if FM Orochimaru was obsessed with Naruto part 4. If you enjoy this video please give it a big thumbs up and to watch more videos like this subscribe to my channel and turn that bell notification on so you never miss an upload. Now wasting no more time let's begin. Rasa looked at his kids. Today was the day they were going to Konoha. A week after they and the other Suna forces got there the attack on AIM would start. He felt a mix of pride, worry, and regret as he watched them. After the Chunin exams, all three had grown up, so he promoted each of them. Kenkiro got better at controlling more than one puppet, and Temuri worked on not relying too much on her war fan. Gara was the one who had changed the most. The Keisgage was sad that he was no longer lost to his own madness, which had been brought on by Rasa's choices. He worked on his stamina and Teijutsu and trained harder. His skills with sand got better and he even started making up to the villagers. Sending them to a war zone wasn't easy. He was their leader and he hadn't really treated them like his children, but he still worried about them like a father. His kids had to be strong and Suna had to be strong too. Everyone wanted him to get even stronger, strong enough to almost not care about his children, kill his wife and keep Suna going without help from the daimyo. He'd been doing it for so long that the cold surface was just part of who he was. Rasa wasn't liked by anyone, and it was possible that no one really respected him as a person. They had to put up with Rasa the Keisgage because no one else could lead Suna like he did. He wanted to bring people together. He wanted his family to be whole again, and he wanted to hug his kids like a father should. They were able to get closer, and he hoped they still had room for him. But he might never see them again because he didn't know if they would come back or if the invasion would work. So, why was he only able to give orders and tell them to make Suna proud? Why couldn't he tell them how proud he was of them and how much he loved them? That he was a cold person because he thought that was the only way to get anything done and keep his village alive. By choosing to lose his wife, he only made it harder for himself to keep up a front. Because acting like the Keisgage was the only way he knew how to act for a long time, and he couldn't just change that in a day. The three of them left, and none of them called him father, only Keisgage sama respectful and right on the mark. That's what he was to them, and they might leave the world thinking he only saw them as weapons and tools, as signs of Suna's power and potential. The kids of a monster, a heartless man who would do anything to gain power. In his quietest thoughts, he would say that he was jealous of Minato Namikaze. He'd ask why everyone loved him so much. He didn't give up his child, did he? He did everything he could to keep Kanoha strong, didn't he? Did they really differ that much? Rasa didn't think they were. But Minato was still respected in every country and hidden village. Iwa hated him and was afraid of him, but he respected him. Rasa only had a second tier Kekei Genkai and was in charge of the weakest of the big five. This changed when Kiri's civil war broke out. So much to do and so many choices to make. But Suna was getting better and its people were getting back their strength and pride. With just a few more years, everything would be worth it. Some more time. Orochimaru took Naruto to a secret lagoon that Tsunade and her when they were kids. She was glad to have a short break, especially since one of her big plans had just come together. It was also needed by Naruto, since he found out he was the leader and that a lowly worm tried to kill him. Naruto has been pushing himself harder and harder in training. His only real breaks were when he went on missions, because even when his body was resting, clones were still doing something for him. She liked how hard he worked, but he was about to burn out at the worst possible time. So, she asked him to join her and told him he couldn't train again until the invasion. Everything went off without a hitch. He had been working so hard that he forgot that it was his birthday today. His teammates and friends were planning something at the recently finished Yuzumaki Manor, but she would have him all to herself before then. She hadn't told her student where they were going. All she told him was that he would need swimwear. As they went on the last leg of their trip, she thought it was cute that he tried not to stare at her. Even though her sheer purple kimono with red accents stopped at the middle of her thigh and showed off her curves. So polite. When he got older, she'd have to break him of that. When they found the lagoon, Naruto had to agree that the clear water and tall trees made it look nice. It was peaceful and quiet, so he could see why Tsunade and Orochimaru Shishu would want to keep it a secret. That, and the other person on their team said he was a super pervert. When Orochimaru took off her kimono to show the black and purple two-piece bikini she was wearing, Naruto did his best not to look at her inappropriately. He hoped that his hormones wouldn't turn against him soon. Naruto heard a splash, which meant that Orochimaru had jumped into the water. He took off his blue shirt and sandals, so all he was wearing was his orange swim trunks. As he got ready to get into the water, he saw that the burns he got from fighting Deidara were gone. 
As he and Team 7 were coming back from their mission in the Land of Snow, they were attacked by the Mad Bomber and Sisori of the Red Sands. Kekashi's sharp senses helped them avoid the first trap, but they couldn't get away from the fight. Thanks to Kekashi, both teams of Konoha Nin were able to avoid the first blast. He knew two people were coming because his senses were as good as any in Yuzuka's. Both teams were nervous, but for different reasons. Team Kuranai had trained and planned to be able to kill any pair of Akatsuki members, except for the leader and his angel. Orochimaru made it clear that the only thing they could do was run away and hide. They didn't plan for an extra team because they didn't know if it would make things easier or harder. Kakashi knew who those two people were and how dangerous even one of them could be. It would be nearly impossible for him to fight them and protect his team, especially since he was about to tell them something they wouldn't like. Team, you should stay back, because these two are too strong for you. No arguments. He lost his temper before Sasuke and Kiba could say anything. He could see why she didn't want to be left out, but this wasn't the kind of fight where mistakes could be made. If I made a mistake, I would die. You ruined my art, un. Didara said this while riding a clay owl in the sky. All this talking is pointless. Let's just grab the fox and go. When they got to the clearing, Sasori said. They had made a good choice, since there were no trees or other places to hide nearby. Two long-range fighters, one of which is better at flying. As Naruto made 20 shadow copies of himself, Kakashi quickly opened his Sharingan. Shikamaru and 10 of the clones ran towards Sasori. The other clones stayed with Kurinai, Shino, and Kakashi. One of the clones roared, Racingan, as it jumped on Sasori. It hit the puppeteer's shell, but its tail pulled it out at the same time. This showed who the real Sasori was. Naruto thought the puppeted man looked proud as he took out a scroll from storage and opened a new puppet. The sand named Keizgij, just like Orochimaru said he'd go for. She fought both with and against Sasori, and she said that the man was always getting worse. Because of this, there was a chance that weaker fighters who knew what to expect could kill him if they planned well and stayed sharp. The puppet ran quickly toward Naruto and Shikamaru, but the Yuzumaki met it with a charge of his own, his sword out. When Sasori freed the dozens of hands sealed in the Keizgij's arm, he blocked the poison blade of the Keizgij puppet and replaced it with a clone. The arms kept moving toward the real Naruto, but some shadow clones were already ready. Wind style, barrage of crescent blades. The Futenjutsu is done by sending out sharp wind blades one after the other from the mouth. They tore through the wooden hands, and as Sasori pulled the Keizgij back, Naruto saw Sasori start to get angry. Then, the puppet shot the iron sand that the Keizgij was known for. Both Naruto and Shikamaru knew that was the sign. Two shadow clones used two different jutsu. One was water style, torrent blast, a sutin jutsu that forms and compresses water chakra in the stomach before shooting it out with enough force to break bones and knock someone out. The second used lightning style, focused bolt, a raten jutsu that focuses chakra at the tips of the index finger and sends a thin, concentrated burst of lightning toward a target. When the two jutsu hit the approaching iron sand, it briefly stopped Sasori's magnetic control. The real Naruto was busy making his own jutsu. He could have done a lot of other things, but this was the best way to kill the puppet and keep Sasori from noticing him. Lava style, burning geyser. Under the Keizgij puppet, molten rock shot up, and the puppet was destroyed by the heat. Sasori showed his surprise for just a split second. They didn't know that the Jinchuriki had a bloodline because they had never heard of him using that kind of jutsu. Sesori tried to move to get more scrolls, but he couldn't. Multiple clones that had surrounded Sesori said, multiple string light formation. Even an S-rank ninja couldn't easily beat them because of how much chakra they had. The ninja art of shadow sewing Shikamaru muttered and sent a number of shadow threads at Sesori's chakra core which they pierced several times. Asuna Ninja was no longer there. Naruto looked over the open space. Shino was coming up to Daidara with a tag that stopped his chakra from moving. Naruto saw that the blonde bomber was smiling, which seemed wrong given the situation. When he did the swap with Shino, he was already shaping chakra. The water style, gummy wall was thrown up, but not in time. The explosion shook the clearing, burned Naruto, and knocked him and his clones out. As Naruto was going to sleep, he thought back to the fight. As they watched the Iwa Nin take to the skies, his clone told Kakashi that Daidara was afraid of lightning. Daidara started hurtling toward the ground all of a sudden. Someone else figured out that it was Kirinai Sensei. Because he hated Itachi, the blonde was becoming resistant to optical genjutsu, 
but Kirinai Sensei was a master of the art and focused on the other senses, like the inner ear, which affected balance. The clones threw Kunai into the air and multiplied them with the Kunai Shadow Clone Jutsu. They then used the lightning style, chain lightning jutsu to make the Kunai even stronger. Kakashi must have taken his eyes off Deidara for a second, so he missed the clone swap. Everything hurt when Naruto came back to himself. He could tell he was getting better, but the burns hurt and he thought his ribs might be broken or cracked. Being tightly held by the claws of a clay bird wasn't making things better. He was up high, really up high. This wasn't the best situation, and he had to play his cards right to stay alive. Naruto ran through all the things he could do. He could move his hands, but if he did that too much, Deidara would notice. He had to get this over with as soon as possible. He could see his team close behind him and hope they were close enough to catch him. Naruto made the hand sign for a few in bunch and then had it appear right next to Deidara. He did this slowly and carefully, ignoring the pain. The first Naruto called up a kunai, put lightning chakra through it, and stabbed it into the bird. This made the bird lose its balance and let him go. The clone of Fuin was able to use the chakra suppression seal, so both ninja were helplessly falling through the sky. Before Naruto hit the ground, he fell asleep. He heard that Kakashi had caught him before he hit the ground. Naruto was lost in his thoughts when he got a face full of water, which made him sputter. His ears were full of his sensei's laugh. He wiped his face with his shirt and then looked at his attacker in surprise. Hyukuku, you are thinking too hard. The point is to calm down. Or am I not a nice person to be with, Naruto-kun? No, you are, not that. Sorry, I was just remembering when Sasori and Deidara came after us. Hmm, that was done well. Even if that stupid sacrifice you have to make got worse. As he waded through the water, Orochimaru said. Naruto didn't respond. The fight may have looked easy, and Kiba certainly seemed to think so, but with all the information they had, the skills of their team, and the planning skills of Anara and Anaburame, there were just too many ways to surprise an enemy who didn't think you were much of a threat. Naruto finally got in the water, and he was glad it wasn't too cold. Orochimaru turned away as Naruto smiled in a sneaky way. She threw water on him, which was a sign of war. He thought that if he didn't get back at her, she couldn't really respect him. He was about to do what he was about to do because of her. In a way, she had asked for it. He didn't like that way of thinking right away, but he kept going with his plan to get even. Naruto put his hands together and left a small gap between them. He took some suit and chakra and put it in his hands. Then, he forced a small, weak stream of chakra through the opening and onto the back of Orochimaru's head. She quickly looked at her apprentice and saw that he was whistling and not looking at her. She was happy. So, you want to fight the snake Sanin? She made up a threat when she talked. I'm sorry, Shishu, what do you mean? Naruto tried to act innocent, but a smile kept coming up on his face, which was a sign that he was guilty. Oh, my apprentice is now full of himself. Do you think you're the only person who knows how to use all five types of nature? Of course not, Orochimaru-sama. I just did it before I got too old for it. He said it in a nice way, but there was a hint of pride in his voice. He had to swim away from a wave of water that was coming toward him. And after that, a few more. Hyukuku is retreating all you can do. How disappointing. I thought you had more fight than that. Orochimaru was stopped when she felt like she was being pulled underwater. Once she was underwater, she saw that a small whirlpool had pulled her under. It went away, and she could move around again. Naruto was startled when Orochimaru cut through the water at speeds that were impossible. She almost got him when she tried to grab him while he was underwater, but Naruto used his chakra to push him deeper underwater and then moved away from his mentor. Orochimaru didn't give up, and Naruto managed to get away from her several times by a hair's breadth. But his luck ran out in the end, and he found himself in the arms of the snake Sanin. She whispered in his ear, nowhere to run, giving him a chill to the bone. Can we discuss this? About you sneaking up on your dear teacher. I was set up. It's just us. They want you to think that. Oh, that's it. And who are they? Orochimaru didn't hear Naruto say anything back, but she felt him grab her and go underwater again. She didn't know what to think about her students' newfound confidence until she saw a very upsetting sight, Conan hovering above them. If Conan was here, Pain was probably here, too. This didn't work out. She watched as Naruto made a lot of copies of himself, and each copy started making hand signs. Water, water style, Lance was the jutsu that was used, and several pressurized jets of water were shot into the sky. Aim's angel, however, was quick enough to avoid them. As the clones kept making hand signs, the jets turned into black clouds that rained oil on the person who used paper ninjutsu. Style of water, onyx rain. The manipulation is similar to Nidame's water style. Bite of the explosive water dragon in that it requires a second manipulation of an existing suit and jutsu. One Naruto comes out of the water with his hands in the tiger seal. 
Waves of fire then come out of his mouth. Fire style. To use Sea of Flames, the user must store air in his cheeks and release chakra from there. This lets him take a breath and start the process over again. Since the flow can be a little bit different, it looks like waves. Surprisingly, a fat ninja with orange hair and piercings all over his face stood in front of the fire jutsu and took it in. When the kusanagi came out of the water, it caught the well-fed nin off guard. It even pierced Naruto in front of him before going through his head. The body fell apart, and the clone turned into a cloud of smoke and disappeared. Now that Conan was on the shore, her paper jutsu couldn't work because she was covered in oil, at least for now. Now there are five more bodies in the water. Naruto Yuzumaki, if you come with me, I might let the traitor go. The one with orange hair and spikes said. The answer was a bunch of tentacles trying to catch all of the ninjas there. They all took to the air to get away from them, which left them open to attack. Several hidden shadow snakes break through the barrier of water and wrap themselves around the multiface shinobi, trying to pull him down. Instead, the snake's heads are cut off by his tail, which has a sharp blade, and the rest of their bodies are grabbed by his hands. He pulled hard, and Orochimaru came up to the surface. As the Asura path pulled Orochimaru up, the human path with the long hair was getting closer, planning to take the snake summoner's soul. Before she could do anything, it was there, with its hand around her neck. When the Ninjendo technique was used, however, Orochimaru turned into mud. The human path didn't have time to think about how stupid it was because its feet were frozen and an exploding kunai appeared in front of it. The kunai went off before the human path had a chance to run away. Even though Pain wasn't angry, he wasn't amused either. Both Naruto and Orochimaru were running out of air, so they would soon have to go to the surface. They were outnumbered, and Orochimaru was quickly figuring out that, since they all had Rinnegan, these bodies might be able to do some of the same things. She didn't know much about Pain, except that anything that got close to him would run away. It wasn't good, but she could and had to make things better. The diva path watched as two huge olive green snakes came up from the ground. One went down the animal path, while the other went down the Asura path. The path said, Almighty push, and the big summons were pushed back, hitting several trees before going away. Orochimaru and Naruto came up to the surface with their swords drawn when they ran out of air and options. She chose the path of the animal, and Naruto chose the path of the Asura. The Asura path's tail pierced Naruto before his sword could hit him, which caused smoke. The animal path was able to deflect the Kusanagi, but it couldn't stop the next attack, which cut off its head. Every Naruto who was left underwater came to the surface and started attacking. Most of the remaining clones were destroyed by the projectiles and multi-arm attacks of the Asura path. The real Naruto tried to cut the diva path. He even cut into the chakra rod that the path made, but he was too slow to get out of the way of the next one. He was stabbed in the right leg and then kicked in the middle, which sent him flying away. The Asura path was now directly fighting Orochimaru, and even though her Kusanagi was doing well, it couldn't stop the path. She was stabbed in the back near her left shoulder and in the stomach without any warning. She fell into the water and just had enough chakra to stay on the surface until the Asura path kicked her in the face hard enough to make her flip over on her back. She looked to see that the three bodies Naruto and her had gotten rid of were back. Naruto saw one of the paths pick up the bodies and throw them into something before bringing back the fully healed people. They had problems. He didn't have much time to think, so he made a whirlpool that was much stronger than the ones he had made before. Orochimaru then sank to the bottom and used the delay to his advantage. Naruto again called up a large number of clones and used the ninja art, smokescreen jutsu. Naruto sent a clone underwater to get Orochimaru. As the real Naruto did the same to himself, he took the rods out of the clone's body. The smokescreen didn't bother the diva path. He used his jutsu again to blow it away and from the sounds of it, he could tell that it was made of more than one copy. When the smoke cleared, he saw that both the Jinchuriki and his master were dying. The only sound was that of birds chirping. The paths watched as the injured pair got back up and made a last-ditch charge, but the damage had already done too much for them. Both had been stabbed more than once, but they were still alive. Orochimaru couldn't help but fly toward the diva path when he used his universal pull technique. The Asura path killed the traitor by sticking a chakra rod into her heart with grim satisfaction. Even though she thought she could defy God, her final punishment wouldn't be death, but the Jinchuriki would die anyway because she didn't protect the reason for her treachery. Reality changed because of the rod, and all of the paths saw that it wasn't Orochimaru they killed, but the Naraka path. They all used the Jinjutsu technique to get rid of it, but it tried to be cast again. It wasn't clear because there was nothing around to cast it. Nothing else. The diva path yelled, Almighty push, and used a lot of chakra to make his attack more powerful. Soon, he heard a lot of poofs, but that was the last time he heard birds chirping. 
It was a form of Jinjutsu that worked with sound, and since there were so many copies, the past thought it probably came from the Uzumaki. They didn't know if he had any important Jinjutsu, and the fact that they didn't know cost them. The rest of the paths felt the same way as the real Nagato, which was that they were fed up. He saw Conan come back, no longer covered in oil, and ready to fight again. But he told the paper clone to go away. He wanted to do this because what they had done had made him angry. Orochimaru and Naruto were sitting in the middle of a forest. Naruto was almost back to full strength thanks to the Kyuubai's chakra, and she had healed thanks to her special replacement technique. Naruto found out that his Jinjutsu had been turned off and that pain was on his way to get them. When Naruto offered to trade Jutsus with Kakashi, Kakashi said that only someone with a sharing in could do his Chidori. Naruto's Jinjutsu, which he called Jinjutsu, Chidori, was his way of giving him the finger. He was glad that Kurenai-sensei had taught the team more about Jinjutsu, like how to layer illusions and attack more than one sense. He was happy about the change because it helped him stop blushing. Orochimaru came out of her replacement technique completely naked, but she didn't seem to notice until she was told. The Sanin made a mental note to include seduction training in his training so that he wouldn't break down when he saw a naked woman. Shishu, they stopped my Jinjutsu, he said. Hmm, did they believe them long enough to get rid of one of them? Yes, the one who healed the others, but that made them mad, so there you go. We need to get more people and buy time. I know you don't like it, but use the Ido Tensei. No, I'm not upset at all. Naruto made two young release, shadow clones and implanted control seals in them. He then got the DNA samples he had saved. He did the jutsu at the same time that Orochimaru did it. Two coffins opened up, and Naruto's clones changed into his two nin who had been revived. When the techniques were done, Deidara and Kasama stood next to the Shodai, and the Nidame Hokage. Naruto gave Deidara some of the special clay that the missing ninja died with and told him to look at Kasama Samhada. Then, one of them took off in the air and the other one took off on the ground. The first two Hokage just looked at Orochimaru and him with a strange look on their faces. Brother, you shouldn't have made that jutsu in the first place. I did a lot of things I shouldn't have, but it's too late to change that now. You, Yuzumaki, why am I here? Tabarama said, I can tell the boy's family tree from his chakra. He was clearly an Yuzumaki and also a Jinchuriki. Okay, here's a quick summary. This group is looking for people like me who are Jinchuriki. Also, Hashirama-sama, we're all pretty much treated like crap, so thanks for that. Anyway, the leader attacked me and my Shishu, and he is very strong. He has the Rinnegan, which is the eyes of the Sage of Six Paths, but his skills seem to be spread out over six different bodies. Each body has a special skill. One can make advanced weapons, and another can control forces that pull in or push away. It is possible to absorb chakra, which makes ninjutsu useless. The other two are unknown to us, Orochimaru added, and then he told them what the ones they knew about looked like. Come on, bro, let's go. Hashirama was surprised by what Tabarama said. Why would I want to do that? Open your eyes, it's clear that the boy is Mido's replacement, and we're getting close to Konoha. Who's to say that this person won't try to hurt the village? The strapling is also hurt, so he can't fight the way he is. Naruto wanted to explain why he hurt his idol, but he realized this wasn't the time. He knew how serious this was and that his life was in danger. All right, bro. As soon as he answered, high-yield explosives could be heard shaking the forest. This made the Senju brothers leave right away. Orochimaru and Naruto both chose to stay where they were and take the break that the Ido Tensei gave them. The Snake Sanin's mind was always thinking of a way to fight back, and the more time she had to plan, the better. While Naruto was telling the Hokage who had come back what was going on, Deidara ran into the animal path, who was on top of a bird summon. The people who could set off explosions didn't waste any time trying to hit the path with them, but the bird was quick in the air and avoided direct damage. The two flew above the trees, and the once dead shinobi was so angry that he stopped trying to attack and just focused on speed to close the gap. Once he did, he jumped off the clay bird and exploded into the air with his body. It killed the bird, but the animal path jumped off its summon just before it hit and landed on a dog with more than one head. When Deidara reformed, he kept laying bombs, but that just made the dog stronger as it grew more and more heads. The animal path called up another animal, a rhino, to join the dog and try to keep Deidara busy until the human path arrived, which was coming quickly. The animals were doing damage while Deidara's attacks were being taken by the dog, which made him very angry. The bomb enthusiast started to fill the area with C4 explosives and watched as not even the dog summons could stop it. The animal path had also been infected, but only in a small area. The human path, which had not been infected, was able to remove the Ido's soul before it could explode again. 
but the path couldn't get away from the wooden spike that went through its head. The diva path looked at the headless body of the Asura path. The same Hada kept the chakra receivers from working for long enough for Kasama to cut off its head. Up until that point, the former Kiri swordsman's attacks were useless because the Preta path was taking all of his damage while the diva and Asura fought back. He pushed the sword away from the dead ninja right away. Kasama started weaving hand signs again for his water shark bomb, which was another suit and jutsu. Just like before, it was absorbed, but the shot I Hakage kicked Preta back. As he sent the man out of the lagoon, the diva path said, Almighty push. He did this to avoid the second Hakage's attack. Kasama did the same, but instead of using ninjutsu, he went on the offensive. The diva path was able to stab the man several times with the chakra rod, which showed that the man wasn't as good at fighting without weapons. When the nidim came back, they attacked together, making it harder for the path to defend itself. The diva path used his jutsu again to push away the Sutan masters. At the same time, he saw the shodai crush the face of the preta path. 5. The diva path didn't respond to what the nidim said. All three Ido Tensei started throwing different water jutsu at the lone path. He was able to avoid most of them until he was surrounded and had to do the almighty push again. The three ninja were on him as soon as he did. He was being attacked from all sides, and blocking two blows made him vulnerable to a third. The attacks never stopped, and the path was getting more and more upset. He was thrown back by Kasama's hard left straight but he was glad for the space. The diva path did his most powerful move as he skidded out of the lagoon and onto dry land. Shibaku Tensei, as the gravity technique's strong pull took hold, everything around it turned over. Each ninja tried to fight against the force of attraction, but they couldn't. Soon, they were all trapped in a small satellite. Nagato was so tired from using chakra that he stumbled and lost his way for a short time. He got better and made his way to where he thought Orochimaru and Naruto would be. Orochimaru and Naruto saw the moon-shaped thing being made and how their last Ido Tensei were put inside. They didn't know how many more paths there were, but they knew they were going in the right direction. Neither was in perfect shape. Orochimaru had lost a lot of chakra when she summoned and healed herself, and neither was in great shape. Naruto's leg mostly got better, but he still couldn't move as well as he used to. They didn't have a lot of time left and needed a plan. You need to go, the Uzumaki said. He wants me to stay alive so that I can buy time until more help arrives. If they haven't shown up yet, something must be going on in the village. He still only wants to kill one of us. He doesn't change. Right now, he wants to kill one of us right away. I have faith you'd come rescue me. When things are so bad, why be nice? Hyukuku, I may blush. Does that mean you're not going anywhere? Naruto asked. No, I'm not leaving so get ready. Naruto didn't waste any more time trying to get her to leave. Instead, he started to get himself back in order. He didn't have a surefire way to use the Kyuubai's chakra, but it worked when he didn't think of it as something he could control but as something he had to go through. Just like how a surfer interacts with a wave. As Naruto went deeper and deeper into the chakra core, he kept telling himself to embrace the wave and become one with it. He kept saying it over and over as he drew more and more chakra from the Kyuubai, leaving the zero-tailed state and making the first cloak. As one tail turned into two, he thought, embrace the wave, embrace the wave. When two turned into three, he stopped pulling. Do you have to say that stupid phrase every time you use my power against me? Germain, you know very well that my name is not Germain, he said. I'm kind of busy here, so just tell me your name, Gyro, so I don't have to guess. The Kyuubai laughed and didn't say anything else, so the conversation ended just as the diva path arrived by itself. He pulled the two Konoha ninja toward him, grabbed each one by the neck, and slammed them down. Naruto swatted the hand away with his tail, and Orochimaru turned into mud as the real Konoichi sped toward pain from his side, Kusanagi shining in the sun. He let go of Naruto and made a chakra rod to meet the legendary sword. The rod was cut in half, but it stopped moving enough to get out of the way of the next blow. He grabbed Naruto's wrist and threw him away just in time to avoid a racing gun. When Orochimaru tried to attack his blind side, he pushed her away, and she hit a tree. The Jinchuriki came back and attacked with fury, but Pain defended himself by kicking Naruto in the stomach and then hitting him in the jaw. He didn't think that the Jinchuriki would be able to take the hit, let alone grab his arm and kick the Rinnegan user in the ribs. Pain was knocked off his feet by the force, which was made stronger by two great breakthrough jutsu done by the teacher and the student. Pain landed on a tree with his feet first and then kicked off. Orochimaru used the hidden shadow snake hands jutsu to stop Pain's charge, but Pain dodged it and kept going. The sound of a sword hitting a chakra rod could be heard. Pain tried several thrusts, but Orochimaru would block them or move out of the way. 
pain went too far with one of these attacks, so the snake Sanon turned away from the attacking arm and twisted the Kusanagi behind her back before bringing it up and aiming it at Pain's face. He quickly pushed her away again, but he also sent a chakra rod toward her. Naruto hit the rod and started again. His body couldn't handle this much of the Kyuubai's chakra for long, and he could feel it giving way under the strain. This made it harder and harder to stay calm and centered. He charged at Pain, ignoring the pain and trying his best to hit him hard. But he was no match for Pain, who began to beat him up with combinations of punches that hit Naruto in the face. Naruto was knocked back and found a chakra rod stuck in his stomach, which ended his biju cloak. Then, as Orochimaru came at him again, he used the same strategy that Naruto tried to stop. Without her student there to block the rod, Pain's weapon pierced her as well. Even though the path didn't show it, he was glad inside. He could feel that the Ido Tensei was trying to get away, and he was being pushed harder than he had thought. He walked over to the Yuzumaki. In a past life, he might have thought of them as family, but now they were just a means to an end. The boy was hurt and bleeding, and his left eye was swollen shut and almost closed. He picked him up by his neck and was careful not to hurt him anymore. This may not mean much to you, but your sacrifice will make peace last. He said this as he ran away with the boy, leaving the snake Sanin with no way to stop him. If the Kyuubai had been sealed in someone else, I could have used a person with your skills. I understand why she lied to us for you. He saw the boy's one good eye get bigger. Didn't you know? She wouldn't have left if I had agreed to find a way to keep you alive after the extraction. But I'm God, and I don't make deals. Why you're no more a god than I am a giant. Naruto found it hard to say. You don't have to trust me, because what you think doesn't matter. Naruto hated this arrogant jerk and wanted nothing more than to shut him up for good. But the rod in his stomach made it hard for him to use his chakra. Naruto felt a tightening around his neck as pain started to move faster. After a minute, though, the path just fell apart, as if its strings had been cut. As Naruto lay on the forest floor, he lost the fight for his mind. Nagato, Conan spoke. She didn't use that name very often because it was the name of a weak boy who was afraid of his own strength, and was happy to lean on his friends. The name of a loser who doesn't know the truth about the world. He got rid of that name and all the flaws that came with it, but he would still use it for her, his last friend, because she knew him before he became the god of this miserable world. What is it, Conan? Itachi, Kasama, Deidara, and Susori all died trying to kill the same person. Kanoha knows this, and thanks to Orochimaru, the Jinchuriki was ready for them. I have no doubt he'll be ready for Kakuzu and Hidden as well. On top of that, we have an epidemic that only affects our shinobi. Death rates on missions are going up, and some are even getting sick from training. I don't. Neither do I they might have done this to make me weaker and easier to kill. Either Kanoha is planning a full-scale invasion for which our people are not ready. There must be sacrifices, Conan. You couldn't have thought that sacrifice would be on everyone else but us. Sacrifices that led to something better. We are no longer hidden. At least one major village knows our plans and has almost stopped us. It's safe to assume Suna knows. Iwa hasn't looked into our real motives because we're too valuable, but they could. Maybe this is a sign we should change our plan. No, there is no other way. According to who? This isn't even our plan, it's his. Some stranger who came to us claiming to be Madara Uchiha. We wanted to save AIM, remember? And we did. Are their lives better now than they were under Hanzo? Are they happy being protected by a god? AIM, in the grand scheme of things, doesn't matter. I have to be able to let go of these attachments. Borders only limit us and make us see other people as fundamentally different from us as an outgroup. It may have been Madara's plan, but it has a better chance of working than Juria's way. He preached understanding to us, but then he trained the most prolific killer in modern shinobi history. Would you even give up yourself? No one, not even me, is safe from this. She didn't show that she was upset by his answer, if she was. You may be okay with the possible losses, but what about the fact that an invasion puts the whole plan at risk, Nagato? They may even be able to kill you. Not a single Konoha ninja has returned. But all three Sanin have, and they have a number of important Jounin. If you die, the plan dies with you. Then, we'll make sure the invasion never happens. What are your plans for that? By giving Kanoha something else to worry about. First, we'll take the Jinchuriki because they won't expect me to come for him personally. Then we'll release the boy's lineage. I'm sure Iwa would love to be able to torture the Yellow Flash's son. That will start a war, but will be a small problem compared to Iwa. And if Iwa gets involved, Kuma will too, just. You want to start another big ninja war. I thought this was supposed to stop all wars. It was, but I can't do that if we don't get the Jinchuriki. War is great for making S-rank ninja and missing ninja who become disillusioned. 
The villages will be too weak to stop us once we fill our ranks. I'll contact Kekuzu and Hidden for a special mission. We leave for Konoha in three days. With that, Nagato and the rest of the diva path left. Conan's face didn't show any emotion, but she was feeling a storm of feelings inside. She finally saw that her last friend was really lost. They were no longer fighting for Yehiko's will, which they had done in the past. She thought that Nagato had pretty much died with his best friend and that she had been helping a husk of a man with too much power and too few ties to the outside world. He'd throw the world into chaos and make a lot of orphans like them who would be lost and hungry without Juria to help them. The thought of what she was going to do broke her heart, but it was time for her to stop being just a supporting character. Ames Angel thought this would make her feel worse when she told Conan, we have the Jinchuriki. She felt a strange calm, like she was ready for whatever would happen next. It was a simple action that had been done so often that no thought was needed. Nagato tried to speak but couldn't, and she asked her why, but she wouldn't say. Her friend had been taken over by Madara for a long time, and she had been too lazy to save him. He died quickly because the cut she made on his neck was so exact. He only felt pain for a moment, but the rest of the time was like being put to sleep. She didn't know if Yehiko would forgive her for what she'd done up to this point, for turning his will into something so ugly and extreme but she'd have to face him once she crossed over. Conan decided to stop thinking so much about what she owed the dead and instead focus on what she could do for the living, starting with aim. She walked out of the cave where she and Nagato had been hiding. Even though the light shining from the entrance felt like a heavy-handed metaphor, she could still appreciate it. She had to kill the Akatsuki in order to get her new dawn. She left the cave and went to meet the people who were waiting for her. This was one of the conditions she set for helping Konoha. Sensei, she said, and almost as soon as she did, he gave her a bear hug. Juria was a bit of a rolling stone, but Conan could tell he still cared. He was sad about losing another student, but there wasn't time for him to show it. He would have to act brave and keep going. But for a short time, both the teacher and the student could cry. When the hug was over, Juria went back to Nagato and put his body in a scroll. He then took Conan to Konoha in the Hakage's tower. Haruzen was the only one waiting for her. Juria was sent away, and the two village leaders were left to work out their differences on their own. Conan Sam, Saru Tobai San. Before we start, I want to say how much I appreciate you. When I got your message, I wasn't sure if it was true, but I'm glad it was. Juria told me about your shared history, so I know words can't express how much you've given. But I hope we can build something so this doesn't happen again. I accept your words, but make no mistake, I hate Konoha. Because of Konoha, my friends are dead. Because Danzo Shimura convinced Hanzo we were planning a coup. Yahiko died and Nagato lost his way. I don't know if you ordered Danzo to act or didn't know, but that means you are either as bad as Danzo was or were careless. I want no alliance with you, only to stop needless deaths. A ceasefire, a treat. Conan was taking a brave stand. But if Konoha attacked Aim after Akatsuki was destroyed, the other major villages that weren't allied with them would think the Leaf was trying to build up to something and would do the same. Sarutobai would just force himself to be involved in the violence he says he doesn't want. It also felt good to tell this man about the crazy dog he couldn't control and the damage he caused to people with his actions or inactions. Haruzen's face didn't change, but he thinks this happened around the time Danzo tried to kill him, probably thinking that Hanzo would help. He was really careless and a fool for wanting to see the best in his old friend Danzo. He wanted to believe that Danzo meant well and only did things that were good for Konoha. The truth was that both men had lied to themselves, and Danzo had made an enemy who, if things had gone differently, could have done a lot of damage. This was just another sign that he didn't belong in this chair, and shouldn't be leading. I get where you're coming from, and if there's nothing else, let's start. Several Konoha Shinobi are busy getting ready for a birthday party at the recently built Yuzumaki Manor. The music was being done by Teuya. The food was being set up by Karin, Hinata, and Ino. Shizune had put together the gifts. Tsunade was supervising, which meant that she was drinking, petting Tauntin, and making suggestions about how to decorate every once in a while. Asuma and Team Kirinai just came back with the cake. It was a round, two-tiered citrus cake with passion fruit filling and vanilla frosting. The cake was simply decorated with blue frosting and orange spirals on top. On the cake board, it said Happy Birthday, Naruto. Shikamaru said, Troublesome, with no apparent reason. Except for Shino, everyone turned to look at the Nara. He looked at their confused faces and sighed. I can tell when Naruto is being especially troublesome, Tsunade said. Several people looked shocked, while Tsunade laughed. 
but Shikamaru's words soon turned out to be true. Karin gasped and started shaking, muttering something about multiple chakra signatures heading toward Orochimaru and Naruto. All the people there ran for the door, but an ANBU agent stopped them and told them to stay in the house. The agent, a woman with purple hair and a cat mask, could have been overruled by Tsunade. But the agent told the future Hakage that Sandame Sama knew about the situation and had a plan. Karin stopped making plans for the party and used her senses to tell what little information she could. She said that it was almost impossible to stay at the new Yuzumaki compound because Naruto and Orochimaru's chakra signatures changed a lot, as if they were broken or hurt badly. Karin didn't understand more and more as the fight went on. The atmosphere was tense, especially after Karin told the group that one more enemy had managed to knock out Orochimaru and run away with Naruto. The room was filled with relief when she said that the sixth signature had vanished, just like the five others, and that Naruto was safe. At that point, Tsunade decided she couldn't wait any longer. It was clear that her friend and surrogate nephew needed help, so she decided not to wait. She let Shizune, Karin, and the rest of Team Kirinai follow her, which pushed back the ANBU that was already there. When they saw the moon-like sphere get pierced and then destroyed by wooden structures, they moved faster until they saw three people come down from the wreckage. The group first found Orochimaru. She took the rod out, but she didn't have enough chakra to heal herself. Karin ran up to his mistress and offered her arm. She was bitten, but it worked, and the snake Sanin got better. Once she could move, the Konoha ninja went to where Naruto was. Orochi, what happened? The leader of the Akatsuki attacked us. What about you? Why didn't you help us right away? An ANBU told us that Sensei was planning something and that we shouldn't get in the way. But when Karin told us you were hurt and Naruto was being taken, we knew the plan had gone wrong and ran away. Orochimaru didn't say anything back. She thought that if Haruzen did have a plan, he wanted her to die before it went into effect so he could say he was innocent. It wasn't the worst plan in the world, but it was based on the big assumption that Pain wouldn't get angry and kill Naruto because he thought it would be easier to catch the real Kyuubai once it reformed if he didn't have a way to break the seal. She would pay him back, but first she had to check on her apprentice. When the group got there, they saw two men standing over Naruto, one of them on his knees. Tsunade gasped in shock as the others slowly moved closer. The slug Sanin looked at her friend and saw her shrug in a way she always did when Orochi did something wrong. She planned to talk to her, but it didn't have to happen right away. Tsunade continued over to Naruto and saw her grandfather healing a stab wound. He still had a swollen cheek and right eye as well as bruising around his neck. She didn't speak to her departed family members instead choosing to heal the damage that hadn't been seen to. In no time Naruto started to stir. The swelling had gone down significantly, and the bruising was gone. He awoke a smiling Shoidai in Tsunade. Obachan, there, it's me. How are you feeling? Like I lost a fight. Is Orochimaru okay? I'm fine. His mentor spoke, having made her way to the group once she saw Naruto waking up. What happened? He just collapsed for no reason. I don't know. Orochimaru answered. So, Tsunade, you became a medic. Taburama asked and Hashirama lit up. This is little Tsuna. My, you've grown so beautiful. Thank you, grandfather. The grandfather and daughter continued to speak as Taburama paid attention to the male Yuzumaki. Having noted there was one more keeping her distance, he watched the boy activate a storage seal. After he'd released the reanimation which dispelled in a cloud of smoke on his wrist, resealing the same hada and retrieving a small rag. He then began to draw a small orb of water from the atmosphere, a method startling similar to Taburama's own, the former Hakage noted. As a final surprise he saw the boy freeze the orb, making it solid ice and wrapping it in the rag to use as a cold compress. I've never known an Yuzumaki to have the Hayaten bloodline. Are you part Yuki? No and I have no bloodline. Naruto said holding the makeshift ice pack to his head. You don't need a bloodline to use the sub-elements, that's a myth. I see ninjutsu has advanced since my time. Tell me, who made this breakthrough? Was it Haruzen? Taburama watched the boy's face adopt a vicious scowl at the mention of his student, time permitting he would get to the bottom of that. The Uzumaki had been a good ally and distant family. He couldn't imagine why one would hate Haruzen. No one taught me, I figured it out on my own. Interesting. Is this talent why you were chosen? He saw another scowl. No, granduncle, let's somewhere private and I'll fill you in on everything. Tsunade said, overhearing the discussion. He nodded and they prepared to move out. Naruto went to his team, all dressed rather casually. Hey, guys, what were you doing before you came here? We were at your home, Naruto. Kirin I asked and saw the boy's surprised face. Why? He knew he told them he'd be with Orochimaru at this time. They just looked at him and then each other. He doesn't know. Shino concluded. Naruto-san, today is your birthday. 
We were planning a surprise party. Oh Naruto replied and tried to ignore the feeling in his chest. He hadn't celebrated his birthday in years, not since he thought the old man turned on him. I'm sorry the surprise was ruined guys but I appreciate it. Nothing more needed to be said as they moved toward his home in silence. When they returned, Naruto saw who else was in attendance. Teuya, who was yelling at Kakashi about his stupid excuses. Ino talking with Hinata while Asuma was speaking to Jiraiya. Once they noticed his return they yelled surprise and Naruto smiled brightly, scratching the back of his head as he suddenly felt very bashful. The party went on, as they ate and talked, Tsunade eventually returning with the first two Hokage. It felt overwhelming for the Yuzumaki heir. Two years ago he'd given up hope things would change, that he'd really make connections. He realized, now, his opinion of the village and his place in it was tied to his feelings toward the old man. Once he lost faith in Haruzen, Naruto wrote off the entire village as being reflexively and resolutely against him. He couldn't believe they'd ever change and if they could never accept him he could never be Hokage. He entered a mild depression when he stopped believing things could improve and had to let go of his first dream as well as the memories of the kind old man that said it were possible. Initially, Naruto concluded that Haruzen had simply been lying to him in order to keep the spirits of the village Jinchuriki up and him mentally stable. It was a bitter pill to swallow that he was manipulated by the Hakage. When he discovered his heritage and what Haruzen kept from him, Naruto had too long believed the bastard as nothing but a craven manipulator to ever reconsider the Sandam's motives. It was just more evidence he never would have permitted Naruto to be more than a war deterrent. After Akiro's bombing attempt and the talk with Kurenai sensei immediately following Naruto thought about her words, about how he'd let his hatred for the old man cause him to channel at others. He had to conclude she was right and if he were maintaining a negative view of the village, not that they'd done anything to change it. Because of hers and then he wasn't being fair in the strictest sense. Maybe they could change, maybe his dream wasn't foolish. He hated it but a part of him still wanted acceptance from the village, acknowledgement that he was of value. To receive that he'd have to acknowledge them and allow the possibility they could change. As long as he let his antipathy for the Sandame color his impression of everyone else that could never happen. He didn't, however, think he could ever truly forgive or reconcile with the old man. He may have understood his reasons, the fact remained he preferred to save face than risk trusting Naruto, knowing he was all the Uzumaki had. It was a deep betrayal of the bond they shared, the man's vanity was clearly more important than anything they forged. But he didn't need Haruzen anymore. He'd built a family, people he could trust and lean on. People that weren't just going to go away. He wasn't alone anymore. After the gift exchange the party wound down, Naruto stepped out, retreating to the roof. Once he reached it Naruto watched the sunset with a serene smile on his face. It had been an emotionally draining day but one of his better birthdays, if not the best save for the near-death experience. The air was starting to cool, as was common for the fall but it felt nice. Soon, Naruto was joined by another party, the Nidame Hakage. Nidame Sama, Tabarama sat beside the Uzumaki. There is no need for such formality, not for a dead man, Naruto. Then what would you prefer I call you? Tabarama is fine. I may have a reputation as a joyless hardass but I never made my family call me by my title. I'll keep that in mind, Nidame Sama. Naruto said with a smile, Tabarama cracked one as well. Cheeky, like much of your clan. The legendary Senju sighed, I owe you an apology Naruto. Not only as a Jinchuriki but as the future leader of the Uzumaki. Tsunade has filled me in on the major events that have occurred since my death. As much as I wish I could say I am surprised, the truth is everything she said made sense. It is not that I knew Haruzen nor Danzo would do these things, it simply didn't fall outside their character. The man sighed again. Haruzen was a preternaturally talented ninja with a caring nature. He was also one that soaked up flattery and praise, not to mention slipping into sentimentality when logic was needed. Danzo was talented, nowhere near Haruzen, but a boy with a great deal of potential. He was also overly rigid and given to dichotomous thinking and fanaticism. I overwatched their development and failed to curtail these flaws. You and yours have suffered for this and I request your forgiveness. I forgive you. Besides the old man is responsible for his own choices. He is but a part of you will always feel some measure of responsibility for those you teach, especially when you assign them your successor. Naruto just nodded, he couldn't exactly relate. He's only ever taught things to children too young to have done anything too bad beyond pranks. What made you dedicate yourself the ninjutsu, especially at such a young age? The academy sensei were jerks and weren't going to teach any ninjutsu for two years, but several of my classmates would be learning clan techniques well before then. I decided if they weren't going to teach ninjutsu I'd make my own and have a library filled with clan techniques to give my family. 
I didn't know the Uzumaki were a clan at that point but I was determined to make them one. Bratty motivation but the follow through is commendable. Now, what about the sub-elements? Chakra isn't magic. We may not understand all of what it can do but it does obey certain rules and it is naturally existing. Almost all chakra researchers agree on that. If that's the case, then why would it operate so contrary to matter that's chakra free? You can make water vapor, water, even viscous liquids but not ice. Or mud, stone, dust but not lava. Didn't make sense to me and since no one was around to tell me I was wrong I never believed I couldn't do it. I may have had a bit of an ego as well. So, the dual elements required for the sub-elements isn't true. It is but it's about how you mold that chakra. Those with Keke Genkai must have some genetic predisposition to combine their elements. It may be the case the real Keke Genkai is innately knowing how to merge and mold various elements but because they are rarely born with more than two affinities they didn't push themselves to see. HM, interesting. I must admit I am from an era that took it as holy writ only bloodline users could perform those types of nature transformation. To see that proven wrong is quite the treat. You mentioned lava and ice, are those the only two you can currently utilize? Naruto started grinning, enjoying being able to show off for his idol. The only two that are even close to battle ready. He cupped his hands together and closed his eyes, focusing on his internal energy. Shortly, various strings of light was being emitted from his palm. Naruto then attempted to direct the energy, managing to send a beam the width of a pencil toward a nearby tree, creating a small hole. Lightning is already a plasma, combined with water and you create a process of electrolysis, and then ionization of the separated hydrogen, making the storm release. Increased power and control. Naruto wiped the beads of sweat that started to form on his head, still smiling. That is truly impressive and to think you can mimic Kumo's signature bloodline. This pleases me greatly. It also affirms my decision. The Nidame said and saw Naruto's puzzled gaze. In your study there are two scrolls brother and I left for you in the clan. I believe you will put the knowledge to good use. Now, I must depart. I need to see Saru before your master releases the jutsu. It has been a pleasure Naruto. Naruto knew the man wouldn't be here long and nodded before saying goodbye. He watched the Nidame leave and then laid back down on the roof as the last of the sun dipped below the horizon. Even with the abduction attempt, Naruto had to consider this the best birthday ever. Fukuku, it appears my apprentice has been keeping secrets from me. Naruto didn't jump when Orochimaru made her presence known. He'd gotten used to her sneaking up on him. She sat beside him, now dressed in a red kimono. I can't reveal everything to my rival. Naruto replied, cheekily. Ah, now you're learning. It, unfortunately, may be your final lesson. Naruto looked at her in confusion. Your apprenticeship was to last up to the invasion. I assume the invasion has been cancelled and there is no way Sarutobai will allow our arrangement to continue. Naruto frowned at that knowing it was true. What happens now? Jiraiya will likely push for you to go on a training trip with him and I think you should go. I would not have expected that. Naruto admitted. And I don't blame you. I may not have much use for Jiraiya but he isn't completely worthless. Naruto chuckled, considering that high praise. A part of him was reluctant to go. He didn't want to leave his family and friends so soon after having made those connections. He didn't want to leave his team. He was sure he still had much to learn from Kurenai sensei Shika would get lazy if you weren't here to motivate him and Shino would get all quiet and reserved. They made each other better so to leave to focus solely on his development felt selfish. However, Naruto did want to get to know his godfather. Jiriya hadn't been in the village much and a training trip would provide ample time to build a relationship. He could also learn more about his father. Also, even if he only provided a sparring partner, training with Jiraiya would have to get him stronger as he had no illusion he could defeat any of the Sanin without the aid of his teammates and weeks of planning. It still sucked that he wouldn't learn under Orochimaru anymore, someone that had supported him for longer than he initially knew but if even she were recommending he do this he couldn't deny the wisdom of the move. I guess it makes sense. Sucks I can't just keep learning with you. Hyukuku, I'm not going anywhere. This is just the end of one phase of our relationship. Rig, I don't just allow anyone to see me naked and live to tell about it. She watched as the boy started to blush and scratch the back of his head. Hyukuku, should I take it as a compliment that managed to stand out during a life and death battle? Such a little charmer. Since you aren't my shishu anymore I can get you back for all your teasing, Titebeo. Oh, really? The snake Sanin moved closer, now whispering in the Uzumaki's ear, then I may just have to escalate before you can. She then kissed him on the cheek and laughed as his entire face reddened. Good night, Naruto-kun she said between laughs not giving her student a chance to respond. Naruto took a few moments to compose himself before returning inside. 
The blush was gone so he was confident there were no witnesses to anything he'd done on the roof. He returned to the living room to see Shino and Shika seemingly in a heated debate. He was a little concerned as the two never argue. Guys, what's wrong? Oh, Naruto-san, maybe you can help us resolve this. Troublesome, I agree we may need your input. Sure, what's wrong? Well, I was telling Shino if I got beat up in front of a girl I liked I'd probably want to die from embarrassment. Whereas I believe I'd simply want to renounce my name and title while I went into hiding from the shame. As we have no experience with this we thought you might be able to help us out. Naruto grit his teeth at the pair of wise asses. If you tell me who you like that can be rectified with ease, Titebao. HM, I believe Temuri-san will be arriving soon. Shikamaru looked at Shino in mild surprise. He didn't think the Aburame would turn on him just yet but he was prepared. Well, lucky for you we don't need to wait. We don't even need to leave. Oi, Tei Shikamaru was tackled by Shino in an effort to shut him up. Naruto stood in shock at what Shikamaru was about to say, before laughing and clutching his stomach. Shino, didn't anyone ever tell you not to play with fire? Especially not a raging freaking inferno. You can't handle that, you're not ready for that. What I am and am not ready for is my decision besides it's not like she's notorious nor beats me down every day. He has a point. I thought Nara men were henpicked but that's downright submissive. And nobody's bottom. And what about you Shika? You say in front of an arena full of people, a man can't lose to a girl, troublesome and then give up like a buster. Shikamaru bristled at Naruto's impression of him. That was very buster-like, I was embarrassed. Shino added. You had a draw with a boy in cat pajamas. Shikamaru retorted. It was a manly draw. Not really, you had a weird twitch going on. Frankly, you both shamed Kirinai-sensei. Thank the sage I was there to clean things up, per usual. Naruto observed. Land of vegetables, land of vegetables. Oh no, neither of you are blaming me for that. Why not? You're a trouble magnet. Shikamaru responded. A short, trouble magnet. Shino added. With no guys. Screw both you shameful bastards. Tough talk for a half pint. Shikamaru, I believe you should have called it big talk to contrast with his lack of stature. I might be slightly shorter than you but I'll wash both you scrubs. Let's step outside. Why? To show you who is the scrub. Spoiler warning, it is you. Troublesome, even I have some pride. Let's do this. The boys departed towards the backyard, oblivious or indifferent to the audience they'd attracted with their argument. The onlookers watched as the Chunin Shinobi disregarded all technique and tactics in their bout of horseplay. It looked more like three brothers roughhousing than actual ninja combat. Your cute, little students are being adorable again, Kirinai, said Kakashi. I can't argue with you there. They've come a long way in a year. You've done well with them. Asuma praised his significant other. They made it easy. Well, not at first but eventually they gelled. You considering taking another team in the future? Asuma questioned, as all three were tuned in she could if she desired so. He saw her shake her head. Unless it was absolutely necessary, I couldn't imagine it. Those are my boys out there. I'd compare any future team I had to them, it wouldn't be fair. The three Jounin continued to chat as they watched the rest of Team Kirinai play. One partigoer, however, was not amused by their antics and let it be known. Stump, if you and those other two dipshits don't get in here and eat some motherfucking cake I'll castrate all three of you tree-hugging bitches. Teuya shouted from a window. Naruto looked sheepish from the ground. Shino adjusted his glasses and Shikamaru just muttered troublesome. She slammed the window shut, believing she'd done enough. Shino, you need to control your chick. Shikamachura said. Shino's only response was for the buzzing to grow louder, but not loud enough to drown out Naruto's laughter. You know we need to talk about this. Tsunade said as Orochimaru when she made their way to the Hakage Tower. She was upset with her friend and disappointed. If I hadn't resurrected them I would be dead. However angry you are at me, at least acknowledge that. Of course I wouldn't want you dead but I have a feeling you didn't find DNA samples of my grandfather and uncle as a means of self-defense. You're right. I plan to use your great uncle's jutsu to kill sensei. Plans changed and an invasion was no longer necessary. Tsunade's eyes went wide. Orochi, you are going to invade Konoha. You know how many people you could have hurt, killed. Thousands. And they would have been worth it to kill sensei. You know I don't care. And since I didn't do it, you shouldn't either. I know you can care. Odo would be a completely miserable place if you simply couldn't. Care is overstating it. I don't need my shinobi to live in squalor. If they are comfortable they are more productive. Indifference isn't malice, you know that. I don't care but unless it becomes necessary I also see no value in causing harm. But sensei was. Years after you left. No, that doesn't make sense. Orochi, what aren't you telling me? I have my reasons and once again, I didn't do it so it doesn't matter. It does if you still plan to kill him. You mean like he tried to kill me today. 
Tsunade looked surprised but waited for her friend to expound. He's had a specific ANBU watching Naruto, and I for the entire time I've been training him. Except, yesterday and today. And it just so happens we get attacked by pain with no backup in sight. He planned to have me die before his plan to stop pain was enacted. Tsunade grimaced. Some of that could be chalked up to coincidence, but the problem is, ninja don't believe in coincidence. Sure, they've heard about them but have never seen them. Dig deep enough and you'll find someone pulling strings. There was a lot of missing information but she couldn't reject Orochi's conclusion. Tsunade didn't know if her former sensei believed she'd turn a blind eye to his dealings similar to how he did for Danzo but she had no intention of doing that. He needed to be unseated. His age and bias against Orochi was leading him toward ruin and he'd done nothing to change that. The two legendary Kanoichi arrived to the tower and headed toward the Sandame's office. They could overhear him speaking to the Shodai and the Nidam. The two women entered, causing the discussions to stop. The sand name immediately narrows his eyes at his once favorite student. That she would use such an abominable jutsu and bring back former Hakage while she were at it. He considered it more evidence of how rotten she was to the very core of her being. I assume you have come to release us. Taburama asked. Yes, I have. Unless Sensei has something else to say. Have you said all you wanted to, Sarutobai Sensei? Get out of my office, or Chimaru. Now, Hyukuku, I'll give you two a moment with Tsunade, I'll be outside. She said and then exited the office. Saru, remember what I told you. Haruzen grimaced but nodded at his teacher's words. Hashirama was too busy crying and hugging Tsunade to care about much of anything else, embarrassing Taburama greatly. The three Senju said their final words and the first two Hakage went to meet Orochimaru, to return to the Pure Land. Tsunade wiped the unshed tears from her eyes before leveling a glare at her sensei. You hoped Orochimaru would be killed in the attack today. It wasn't a question nor an accusation. She's evil and will corrupt Naruto-kun along with who knows how many others. She's a threat, I wish you could see it. I'm not just some paranoid, old man. If you make her your enemy she will be your enemy. And nothing she's done has harmed Naruto, can you say the same? When Haruzen didn't answer she continued, I'm not going to turn ignore people operating behind my back sensei, not even you. You wanted me to be Hakage but I won't be a puppet nor am I too tired to meet any challenges to my authority. I consider myself warned. Good, was the last thing the Senju princess said before departing for the night. Haruzen waited several moments before doing the same but his destination was not home, not yet. He entered a secure ANBU facility, the operatives bowing in respect as he walked the halls. It didn't take him long to reach the interrogation room he was seeking. Ibuki had clearly been hard at work. The subject looked as if he was nearing his breaking point. That was fine, he was a disposable piece in this game. Haruzen entered, instantly gaining the attention of his top interrogator and the man's latest subject. At ease, Ibuki. He ordered and the bear of a man complied. Haruzen took a seat at the table, beside Ibuki but across from the subject. You have exactly one chance to save your life. H. Howell, you will be my spy. You will inform me of everything Orochimaru does, where she goes and who she meets. No, Kabuto-san, I don't think you understand. I could have you killed right now for leaking my shinobi's whereabouts to Sasori. That's treason, but instant death would be a mercy. I could turn over the signed statement of AIM's new leader to Orochimaru directly and let her do as she pleases. How many weeks do you think you'd spend dying under her care? Kabuto paled as a great deal of fear entered his eyes. Orochimaru would make him suffer for as long as she could. But worse than the torture, she'd lose all respect and fondness for the medic she saved from Sesori. He didn't want to continue to betray her but he wasn't self-sacrificial. He agreed to work with the Sandame, hating himself more with every word spoken. Haruzen, by no means, trusted the boy. If he provided good intel then it would be a plus but if he faltered or attempted to obfuscate for Orochimaru Haruzen would show her the confession and plant a seed of mistrust in her other assets. Hopefully, she'd turn cruel and alienate more and more of them. People that would welcome Haruzen's kindness and grandfatherly charm. Kabuto may not be enough to take her down but he'd be a start, the tipping point to her downfall. Baki and the Sand siblings made their way to the Hakage Tower. Even though the three younger ninja weren't used to preparing for war, they all found it strange how calm the Kanoha ninja seemed, as if they didn't care about anything. As soon as they got to the tower, they were able to talk to the Hakage. The man looked very different from his ninja. He seemed very worried about something. They all bowed to the Hakage with respect, and he nodded back. Haruzen started by saying, I'm glad you're here. I have a lot to talk about, and not all of it will be easy. Three days ago, the leader of the Akatsuki attacked two of my shinobi, 
Orochimaru of the Sanin and Naruto of the Uzumaki. The leader's second-in-command told me about the attack before it happened. She planned to betray the leader for her own reasons and wanted to make a peace treaty with Konoha. The double-crossed work. The Akatsuki is basically dead and our invasion is no longer needed. The new leader of AIM told me that the previous leader, a man named Payne, sent two of the remaining Akatsuki members on a mission but didn't tell her what it was. Just yesterday, I found out what that mission was. Hidden and Kakuzu were sent to Suna and killed the Keisuke. And sorry for your loss. Haruzen wasn't surprised that none of the other ninjas showed any reaction. They had been trained well. And if they were in front of a foreign leader, they wouldn't show any signs of weakness. Baki spoke after taking a moment to think. How did they know where they were going? Hakage-sama. Baki nodded. Yes, toward the land of rivers, but they weren't followed past your borders. I'll tell the forces here, and they'll go back right away. Can I ask for something? I'll do what I can, Baki-san. I would like a team to help us. One of Rasa mistakes Sama's was not going after Sasori when he was suspected of killing the Sandam. I won't make the same mistake, and Sesori's killers will be brought to justice. You're thinking about a tracker squad, right? Yes, maybe one that knows our targets and has a strong attack to match ours, Haruzen said. He then flared his chakra, and an ANBU wearing a boar mask appeared. Bring me team Kiranai. Baki told his students, I need you three to step out, and they did as he said. Now that he was alone, he had something he needed to tell the Hakage. Hakage-sama, you need to know something about one of your shinobi, Naruto Uzumaki. And, Baki-san, what would that be? Rasa-sama knew who his parents were and planned to use that information to renegotiate our alliance. If something happened to him, he made plans for the information to be sent to Kumo, Kiri, and Iwa. I knew his general plans, but I didn't know where he kept the information or who he would use to send it. Haruzen thought, that fool. He wanted to kill the Keisgage so much. It would be hard to plan for how they would react. Onoki and I could just not care, or they could use it as a reason to do something bad to Konoha. The San siblings came back with Team Kirinai, and Haruzen told them what their mission was. It was dangerous, but he thought they could do it because they were so ready to fight the Akatsuki. After they left, Haruzen again called for an ANBU agent. Hare, get the Elder Council, he said. In fact, Hakage-sama, they are waiting for you in the big conference room with the clan leaders and the Sanin. Haruzen sent the agent away and went to the room, wondering what this meeting could be about. Haruzen saw a lot of hard looks directed at him when he walked in, but Hamura and Koharu just looked sad. He just couldn't figure out what this was all about. As the Sandame sat down, Hayashi said, Thank you for coming, Hakage-sama. I asked for this meeting because I'm worried about how you treat the Uzumaki clan. During your reign, several of your decisions have hurt the Uzumaki clan a lot, like when you didn't help them right away when they had been a long-time ally of the Senju and Konoha. Then there was the decision to wear their crest but not teach about the Uzumaki in our academy, letting future generations believe they didn't exist. Last but not least, we have Uzumaki Naruto. Not only did you break the rules set by the previous daimyo, but you also stole money from a clan account that the sole heir was not allowed to use. Instead of making him live on public assistance, you stole from him. You also let your friend steal and reveal Naruto identity sans as a jinchuriki. You also planned to have a Konoha Kanoichi seduce Naruto S. These violations against the Uzumaki, against the idea of clan autonomy, and against the daimyo have led me to one conclusion. I, Hyuga Hayashi, as clan head of the Hyuga clan, have lost faith and confidence in your leadership of the village, and I ask you to step down immediately. I know that this declaration has no legal force and is only symbolic, but I will continue anyway. Haruzen felt like he'd been slapped in the face. He could see Orochimaru smirking out of the corner of his eye and knew this was payback for the attack by the Akatsuki. He thought about what his sensei had said about how her past and future sins didn't make him feel better about his. He couldn't get off the hook by blaming her. Haruzen couldn't argue with the wisdom, but he also couldn't fully accept it. Tabarama sensei didn't know how dark inside she really was. She has no compassion, no empathy, and will do anything to get what she wants. He felt like he was the only normal person on an island full of crazy people. Do the rest of you feel the same way? Yes, said the clan leaders. They looked sad and disappointed at the same time. Haruzen knew what he had to do. He could try to justify his actions, but that wouldn't change the fact that he'd once again given her what she wanted. He had to let some things go because he was trying to do too much. He couldn't find out what she was planning and still be the village leader. He had to take the temporary loss. Then, as my last act as Hokage, I named Senju Tsunade my successor and the god Aim Hokage. I will not deny the actions listed by Hayashi, but it was never because I had a bias against the Uzumaki, especially not Naruto. 
However, intentions don't always matter, and I have wronged that young man many times. It has been my sincere honor to serve as your Hakage. I resign immediately. Haruzen left the room, closely followed by two of his students and the elder council. The leaders of the clans also left, so only Hayashi and Orochimaru were left. Hayashi said, disgusted that he had dragged the Sandame through the mud, now we're even. Kyukuku, fix your face, Hayashi-kun. Nothing you said was a lie. So, you added a different interpretation. Isn't that a small price to pay for your nephew's career? Hayashi didn't answer, and instead he chose to walk away. He didn't feel good about what he did, but it was the least painful way to pay off his debt to the snake salmon. His clan was better off without her. No matter how many times he said it, it didn't give him much comfort. Haruzen sat down at his desk for the last time in the Hokage's office. He didn't have time to think about what had happened or get lost in a fog of memories. Tsunade had to know exactly what she was getting so she could be ready to lead her people. Tsunade, there's something I wanted to tell you before that charade. The Keizkage had information ready to send to Kiri, Kumo, and Iwa in case he died suddenly. It has Naruto's heritage and who knows what else. His former second, Baki, told me before he left with Team Kiranai. As three people were looking at Haruzen and Haruzen was looking at Tsunade, no one saw Jiraiya get even the slightest bit tense. He didn't know the Keizkage was dead because his sensei didn't tell him. Who killed Rasa, sensei? Jiraiya asked. Kakuzu and Hidden. That was Nagato's last thing to do. Homura said, we need to start getting ready. How and for what are they getting ready? Minato has a living son, so we can't believe Iwa will mobilize because of that, Koharu said. Haruzen said, we have to assume both, even if it's just a ruse, especially Kumo. They were the most reluctant to disarm, and it's likely they haven't. So Tsunade asked, why haven't they attacked? It would have been great after the Kyuubai attack. I may be old, but I still have enough power to put I in his place if I have to, Haruzen said. Tsunade said, it's a good thing we've been preparing for an invasion. We'll just have to keep our ninja working hard. Harder, especially for young, high-value targets. Guys, Asuma's and Kakashi's teams, as well as Team Kiranai, will get extra attention, Koharu said. Tsunade asked, how much time do we have to get ready? I don't know. We should think of our relationship with Kumo and Iwa as a cold war. It would be smart to warn our forces to expect more skirmishes. I will want time to really ramp up, but a single incident can start an all-out war. Unoki might be moved to start an all-out war, but it would still take time unless his hatred for Minato just makes his shinobi lose control. Haruzen replied, I'm still taking the kid on a training trip. Kuma won't waste the number of ninja they'd need to send to kill us both, and I'll stay far away from land of earth. Then you'll need to be serious, Jiraiya, he said. Jiraiya got angry at the jab. We've talked about this, sensei. You made me think I shouldn't train him harder during the Chunin exams. You sent me out into the field while we were preparing for aim. And you gave him to Orochimaru as a student. I'll make sure he can handle anything, and I would have if I'd been allowed to do my job. Now is not the time to. This is the perfect time. Why were Orochimaru and Naruto facing Nagato alone? It doesn't take a genius to figure out that you were hoping she'd die and counting on them needing Naruto alive. But he could have been maimed or hurt in some other way that ended his career, or Nagato could have killed him. All because of your obsession, and look what it got you. How did Hayashi even know about a mission you never gave him? Jiraiya, you're right, but now isn't the time. We have an advantage because I is predictable, so we won't be caught off guard. Your problems with Haruzen will have to wait, Koharu said. In response, Jiraiya only huffed. If we're going to talk about Orochimaru, we need a Danzo, said Tsunade. You want to give her freedom to do things outside of the rules. We already have Odo, Sensei. It seems like a good use, and since they didn't get your attention until Orochi wanted them to, I think they're up for it. Also, I wasn't asking permission, and while I agree with Koharu, we'll also be talking about that stunt you pulled. As the summoning jutsu smoke cleared, a full-grown panther was there. She looked like she was on guard and ready to attack if the situation called for it. She quickly looks around and sees that there is no immediate danger because her summoner looks calm. She said, Naruto. He replied, Akoi-chan, I guess you didn't call me to come over for a party, so what can I do for you today? Remember what I told you and the others about the Akatsuki? Yes, said the panther. Well, Kakuzu and Hidden, two of them, killed the Keisuke. The last time anyone saw them, they were going to the land of rivers. Then you want to go hunting. Yes, but only to find them, don't fight, he said. The panther didn't seem too excited about that. Naruto, you can't think that two shinobi would be too strong for the best of our kind, can you? No, I don't, because this isn't my mission. Instead, my team is helping Suna. That made the warrior summons happy, and her angry face went away. 
I'll have the whole Dora Millage look for them and report back to you. But you need to give us some real work soon, Naruto. Oh, and I'm bringing Majila. Before Naruto could say anything, Akoi was gone. Temuri said sarcastically, I see you keep your summons in order. What's more important is that we have trackers out there. We should head toward the land of rivers anyway, because they might still be there, said Baki. He had sent the rest of the Suna Shinobi back home, many of them sad that another of their cage had been killed. Not many liked Rasa, but he was their leader. They were sure he'd be avenged, since Gara was considered the most powerful ninja they had, excluding Rasa, and Baki was also a very elite shinobi. Both teams left soon after, only stopping to share information and start planning. Baki was impressed by how much information Team Kurenai had on the two missing ninja and how some of the Nara's early plans took into account all of their skills, having just learned about Baki's and the information exchange. As she sped through the forest of death, she couldn't help but feel proud of herself. After humiliating Haruzen, the snake Sanin was on to her next target. There was no guarantee that things would go the way she wanted, but she had little to lose by trying. Anko was immediately aware of the arrival of a new presence, one she'd been seeing more and more of since her cursed seal was broken. Anko didn't know what to make of Orochimaru's behavior. The woman had been giving her new jutsu and even giving her more access to the snake summoning clan. All of this was made more confusing by Anko's own feelings, which came from her memories coming back. Orochimaru told him, I want you to finish your training under me. Well, no pre-play, just shove it in, Anko said, mostly to hide how shocked she was. And here I thought you liked things rough. You may want to find new sources or find better targets for the ones you already have. I don't think you're very interested in my sexual life. Tsk, 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 Anko-chan. You know that my curiosity is endless and that almost nothing escapes it. Yeah, sure. What do you want to do? I think you can be better than you are, and I'm partly to blame for the fact that you haven't reached your full potential yet. I want to make it right. And where do you think my limits end? Anko couldn't say no to the offer. She'd gotten better since her sensei left, but it hadn't been as big of a change as when she was being trained by the Sanin. The chance to get even better wasn't something she could just turn down, not in her line of work. It's hard to say, Anko-chan, but I think you can become an S-rank ninja by the time we're done. Any ninja would be interested in becoming S-rank, but Anko wasn't sure that was true if Orochimaru would be training more than one student. What about the student you have now? His training as an apprentice is almost over, and Juria will take over. What is so special about this spoiled brat that two of the Sanin want to train him? You're a ninja, figure it out. Or, worry more about yourself. Anko-chan, are you in? Yeah, fine. But no experiments. Hyukuku, we'll see. Hayashi heard the rhythmic thuds of a striking post when he got to his destination. He felt dirty and uneasy about what he did to the Sandame, but he couldn't take it back. Now, he was on to something new, but related, and he didn't like what would happen. He told himself it was for the clan and Hinata's safety, but he didn't think she would agree. He stopped a few dozen feet away and watched her train. Many people didn't think she had the skill to use strikes that were both powerful and smooth. It was hard not to think about the arguments from the past, when she was accused of breaking tradition because she wasn't good enough. She was called shameful and a disgrace because no one could see her, and her general aloofness didn't help her reputation. The fact that she didn't care hurt her even more. Father, she said calmly, without taking her eyes off the training post. There was a time when he would have been offended by the greeting, which lacked both warmth and respect. It wasn't informal or formal, it was just an acknowledgement that he was near her. Daughter, we need to talk, he said. Hinata turned toward him and moved closer, but she wasn't in a hurry. When she was close enough, Hayashi said, I'll be brief. You are no longer to associate with the Yuzumaki. Hinata looked at him for a few seconds before turning around and going back to the training post. I do not doubt you are, I simply do not care. Hinata, I've put up with you for a long time, he said. That did make her turn around. You have put up with, tolerated, and what great things have I done for you, Honorable Hyuga Hayashi-sama, to be so kind to me. How have I done something to make the gods give me this most humbling gift? This is not the time to be a brat, Hayashi snapped back. It seems like you've found time for some. Really, dad? Telling me to stay away from three people, as if they'll tie my soul. Do the Hyuga really worry about three teens? I worry about how each of them is linked to Orochimaru. That worries me, and I don't want you to get involved with it or with them. You mean the woman you put the whole Hyuga clan in debt with to save Neji's career as a shinobi? Maybe my female brain just can't understand the difference or the logic behind it. That was important and good for the clan. Yes, giving power to the boy who wants to kill both of your daughters is really good for the clan. If only I had been born with the penis needed to lead and the courage to never question what has always been done. 
Hayashi had to say something right away. He knew Neji hated the main branch because his genius wasn't given enough credit. He also remembered how Hinata's interests and skills were written off as something a girl would be interested in or something a princess would do for fun. He rarely defended her, letting others say what he was feeling. It was shameful and cowardly, and it had hurt their relationship. I have made mistakes, but what I want to do is for the clan. Hayashi felt a wave of killing intent wash over him. It wasn't anything he couldn't shake off, but it was enough to be noticed. He saw Hinata shaking with her Bayakugan on. I hate that word, clan. All the time for the clan. Exist for the clan, kill for the clan, change for the clan, and train for the clan. Serve the clan as a slave. Don't care about the clan. I dislike this word. You talk about the clan, but I'm not sure what you mean. You tell everyone to make a sacrifice for the clan, but aren't they the clan? Or the people you made servants not the clan? But you might be right to forget about the people. I haven't, and I don't like most of them. So proud and full of themselves, but they haven't done anything. They live off of other people's success and feel like they have the right to do so because they are part of the clan. Hinata stopped her rant when she felt herself losing control. It wouldn't help her to lose control. As quickly as the mask of indifference fell off, it was back on and her frown was gone. Who I hang out with is none of your business, father. That's all she said before she did a shunshin. S saw, just short of her destination and ran the rest of the way. Uts didn't mean she couldn't try. T didn't. Hinata-chan, what can I do to help you? Hinata said, I want to change our deal. Oh, and what changes would you like to make? Let him go, I told you. Him, he asked, but he already knew who the girl was talking about. Naruto-kun, I want you to set him free. No, I told you that silly crush of yours would never go anywhere and couldn't go anywhere. What do you think is different? You want it to, right? No, please don't do it for me. Aside from him, he deserves something real and true. No more lies and tricks. I didn't tell him a lie. But you are manipulating him. He doesn't know that you've had multiple people watching him for years. He doesn't know that his so-called family will always be more loyal to you than to him. He doesn't know that you'd never let him choose anything else but to be with you. He knows more than you think he does. He knows I've been following him and that I've sent people into the village to spy on him. He doesn't know much about you, but you can tell him whatever you want. Tayuya and Karin may be more loyal to me, but that won't be much of a problem in the future. We will both want the same things. Do you think I made him feel like he had no choice by having one of my snakes mesmerize him? Did I give him an apple that was magical? Hyukuku. Hinata frowned. She hadn't come here to be a show, but she should have known this was pointless. Maybe she did know, and that's why she was here, to remind herself of what she'd agreed to and what she'd done. But you do make a good point. I'm not giving him any options. If my gentler, more subtle ways don't work, I can try something else. Nothing he would dislike. But I don't see why this is important to you. He does well. He could get angry and hurt people. He could refuse to help other people because so few people helped him. But that's not who he is. He is friendly and open, and will make friends with anyone who tries even a little bit. He's my friend, and I want good things to happen to him. Something genuine. That's not me. Hinata just looked at Orochimaru and didn't answer. I won't get mad at you because I know you meant well. But you don't care about this, and there's no point in fighting what will happen anyway. You will still get what I told you, though. Under what terms? I think it's pretty clear, Hinata-chan. Don't cross me and don't get in my way. Having said what she wanted to say and seeing that it went the way she thought it would, Hinata left. Five minutes later, there was another knock on the door. Orochimaru opened it again, not surprised but also not happy to see Juriya looking very worried. Are you okay? Shikamaru asked. The beautiful night sky was filled with stars. If not for what the next day would bring, he'd love nothing more than to stare at them. But he had to do something more important right now. I'm not sure what to say to that. Tomorrow, we're going to attack an s rank shinobi who is said to be impossible to kill as payback for a man who used his children as tools. Well, those who are lucky. Gara, he just made him feel bad until he broke. Still, we march off to face the people who killed him. Should I be okay with that? You're right, he said as he sat down next to Temuri. Sorry, I didn't mean to give you a hard time. This is a lot, and I'm not sure if my father is worth putting my brothers in danger for. Shikamaru didn't say anything. He really didn't know what to say. He might find them annoying, but he's always had the support of his parents. He wasn't naive and knew terrible things happened, but he couldn't connect with the experience in a real way. Instead, he reached for her hand, never taking his eyes off the sky. After a moment of silence, Shikamaru said, I honestly can't relate, and I don't want to use cliches because that would be too much trouble. 
I'm an only child, and not many people in my clan are my age. So, when I was growing up, I really only had my best friend Chaoji until I got my Genin teammates. You seem to be friends. We haven't always been. Shino can be a bit stiff, and some people say I'm lazy. You are. I'd rather call it hard-working efficiency. In Naruto he was in 12 different kinds of pain and didn't know where to put it all. It took us a few months to get to know each other, for Shino to realize we wouldn't shun him and for Naruto to get over his survivor's guilt and start talking. How about yourself? I was to get involved, too. Once we were all on the same page, we worked well together. I even got to the point where I didn't mind the work and would do things I used to try very hard to avoid. You probably won't figure out how you feel about your dad tonight, but if you need a reason to keep going and give it your all, do it for your brothers and worry about the rest later. Temery laughed and said, And here I thought you were the dumb one. That it hurt if you didn't have to live with the knowledge that the only time you've beaten me is because I let you win. Her laughter stopped and a scowl made its way onto her face. Temery went back to her tent muttering about rematches and getting revenge on lazy asses. Shikamaru could only think about how troublesome it would all be and also how little he'd mind it. The next day, the two teams followed their targets as they walked through a forest. When they reached a clearing, Baki gave the signal that this was where they would attack. Shikamaru threw a kunai with an explosive tag at the former Akatsuki. The explosion split them apart, but neither of them was hurt. Kakuzu said, I was wondering when you were going to attack, since you've been following us for two days. What? They've been following us that long and you didn't say anything. What in the hell? No matter what, I'll give them to Jashin-sama as a sacrifice. Hidden, shut up. Also, two of them are Jinchiriki, which means they can't hurt us. Then I'll take care of the rest. No, there's a reward for the tall Suna ninja. That's right, right. The elite Jounin didn't say anything back. This is a load of crap. Just take the Konoha ninja and remember that they killed Sasori and Daidara, so don't die a stupid death. Hidden yelled, Fuck you, blasphemer, as he recklessly charged at the Konoha team. The Konoha team ran into the trees, which was an obvious way to separate the two teams of ninja, but Hidden didn't care because he had three new sacrifices to torture and a Jinchiriki to kill. Kakuzu didn't care that he was alone, and he didn't fear the ninja who stood in front of him. He decided it would be best to take out the most dangerous opponent first, then go after the other three. In a burst of speed, too fast for Temuri and Kenkiro to follow, and apparently too fast for Baki to react to, Kakuzu was in front of Gara. He aimed a punch straight at the sand user's heart and the missing ninjas were surrounded by a cloud of dust from a powerful explosion. But no one was satisfied to think that was enough. Naruto used hand signs to drop the false surrounding jutsu on Gara and himself, while Temuri completely opened her fan and gave it a powerful swing. Wind style, great sickle weasel jutsu met fire style, sea of flames to create a huge firestorm that set much of the targeted area on fire. Tekuzu appeared on top of an undamaged tree. He wouldn't say it, but that trick took out two of his hearts, as they hadn't been able to get out of his body. The Suna Ninja and Naruto saw where Kakuzu was and got ready. They knew that the trick had done some damage, but the real fight was about to start. Kakuzu charged right away, and Baki decided to meet the unspoken challenge. Even though Hidden was faster, stronger, and better than the non-believing filth he was chasing, he couldn't close the distance and couldn't land a strike. His aim was always just a little off. If not that, he had to get out of a trap or power through an explosion. It was frustrating. He just wanted to kill them a little, why did they make it so hard? He'd make it extra painful for the trouble they'd given him. The Jashinus touched the ground for a moment and couldn't move. Then he saw two flashes. He screamed bloody murder when he saw that his head and torso had been cut off. The woman and the red-haired one he wasn't supposed to kill stood over him, ignoring his curses and promises of endless pain. Kirinai wiped a bit of sweat off her forehead. Using such subtle Jinjutsu while moving was hard, and it took a lot of concentration. But it worked out in the end, and now Team Kuranai was heading back to Team Baki, ready to finish this mission. Naruto's report that his clone had been destroyed sped them up even more. Kakuzu was feeling the same way as his partner. Things had been going well. He beat Baki in midair, even getting the Suna Ninja into a pile driver. It should have killed Baki, but it only knocked him out as the Kyuubai Jinchiriki somehow softened the blow with some bouncing water jutsu. Kakuzu didn't have much time to think as he had to dodge the onslaught of sand attacks. Gara put up a barrier to protect Temuri from the fire nature mask and the lightning nature mask, but the lightning chakra almost broke through it. Kakuzu dashed toward Kenkuro, avoiding Ant and Crow, and beat him up. Gara was now attacking, but the two masked creatures were quick enough to avoid his attacks, even his sand spears. Temuri was able to stop the lightning attacks, but it was draining her chakra reserves. They were losing the battle of attrition 
and there was no telling when Team Kira and I would come back. Arg! Baki cried out as Kakuzu's threads pierced his arms and legs. The missing ninja was about to take his heart, but Naruto cut Baki free by moving at his maximum. non by chakra enabled speed. He then shunshined away. Kakuzu called his masks back, planning to end this. Naruto's water style. Water Lance sent the fire mask right into Gara's sand coffin, finishing it. The lightning mask got back to Kakuzu just as he sent his other hand underground. It came up behind Temuri, grabbed her ankle, and broke it, making her scream. Kakuzu thought he had stopped Naruto's approach, but Naruto's use of his supersonic chakra-infused sword made quick work of it, allowing him to reach and stab Kakuzu in the back. This made Kakuzu even angrier because he'd wasted time holding back against a clone. He was ready to beat the remaining Jinchuriki into submission when he suddenly felt like the weight of the world was on his shoulders. The gravity seal the shadow clone put on Kakuzu had finished calibrating and activated, immobilizing the former tacky ninja. He couldn't believe he was going to die at the hands of children. He was a ninja who had fought Hashirama Senju and won. He didn't have long to think about how unfair it was before Gara performed his sand waterfall funeral, crushing the remaining hearts of Kakuzu and killing the longtime ninja. The two teams stayed there for only a few days until Baki was well enough to travel. Temuri's ankle would take a little longer to heal, so they said their goodbyes. Shino and Naruto noticed that Shikamaru paid a little more attention to Temuri, which annoyed the Nara air. It took them two days to get back to Konoha, not knowing what problems they would face in the near future. Darui looked over the papers Isama gave him. There were some confirmed facts and a lot of guesswork about a certain Chunin, one Yuzumaki Naruto. If even half of what the elite Jounin read was true, the boy would be a monster when he grew up. Darui had no problem admitting this, even though a boy mastering all five nature releases without the help of a Keke Genkai seemed unlikely. But, once again, if even half of this were true, the boy was now just as smart as his father, assuming Minato Namikaze was his father. A possible S-class shinobi or the identity of a Jinchuriki were always things to keep an eye out for. Darui wouldn't say this wasn't valuable information, if it was true. But based on what she knew, Isama was going to completely overreact. Where Darui saw a child with a lot of potential, Isama saw justification to pursue his biggest dream. A goal with real costs, and what would be the justification? Kanoa preparing a superweapon because he has a grudge against Kumo. Even if the kid did hate Kumo, not that Darui would blame him, that wasn't how Kanoha worked. Isama was able to convince most of the forces that Kanoha tried to pull a double cross during the Hyuuga incident. But there were enough senior ninja who knew that was not true. Those who did felt a lot of shame. Yes, a ninja does what they can to help their village and finish their mission. But taking a little girl hostage under the banner of peace was more than dishonorable. If you don't have standards, you're not much better than animals. And Darui thought there had to be some lines you wouldn't cross just for power. Say what you want to say, Darui. I told his number two. Darui frowned in response. There's still time to call this off, Isama. Why would I want to? I asked, but he didn't wait for a reply. Before the hidden villages, my clan went where they wanted, conquered people, and took land. We were never meant to be holed up on a mountain. Hashirama and Madara changed the game, both too powerful to be opposed. We had to join forces with others just to keep up. Taburama, not as powerful but smarter and more cruel. We were never as strong as we were then. Who you respected. I did respect him and acknowledge his skills, just like my father and the others did for the other Hokage. We've had to hold back because of it, because of them. But now, there is a short window. They are lulled by peace and won't protect their next generation as they should. We can cripple them and finally be the rolling storm we were always meant to be, I said, reveling in a sense of destiny. His chance to finally beat his father by making Kumo, and lose a lot of good people to the cause. We have more than enough now and are not in danger from anyone, Darui said. It's not good enough. Konoha has dominated the modern shinobi age for too long, and it's time to stop. Kuma will be the best, and will show it. Darui said nothing in response because he thought there was no point. I, the Jounin thought, had a wrong sense of destiny. He wanted to go to war with Kanoha again for no reason and very little reward. A major hidden village hadn't been completely destroyed yet for a reason, and Kanoha hadn't lost a war yet for a reason. Darui would do his job and try to lead those under his command as best he could. But he wished I would think again. As he got older, the Sandame had mellowed and learned the value of a strong and safe Kumo. The man didn't dream of victory or conquest. Instead, he thought about the times of peace they had. I ignored that and instead thought about who his father was when he was a much younger man. It was not for Kumo. I treated Kumo as if it existed for him, not as if Kumo existed for him. 
but the power of self-delusion had convinced him otherwise. Darui would do his job and protect his teammates because Kumo was more than its cage and his childish whims. Anoki went over the file once more. Really, he didn't care. It was a single boy from the most peaceful large village. He would be more than happy to forget he existed, and if his shinobi found out about the boy, he would tell them to do the same. Iwa may hate the yellow flash, but they didn't have time for a pointless grudge. It was war, and the blonde jerk only did what he should have. Kuma was the problem, Anoki thought. He knew unruly. One of the reasons Anoki used the Akatsuki was because he was the only leader who didn't get rid of his army after the last war. It wasn't easy to forget that the group was hiding a traitor to him and his village, but they were useful for the hardest jobs his forces weren't ready for yet. I would probably see this as an opportunity. The man was predictable, and the fact that it hadn't killed him yet was a sign of his power and Kumo's strength. Iwa and Kumo could only work together because Konoha separated them. If Konoha hadn't done that, Onoki knows that I would see him as a threat and a target. The question became, could he use this to help Iwa? He didn't need personal glory because he'd earned enough in his life, but he couldn't stop himself from thinking about good options. War was rarely easy, but if you looked for them, there were opportunities. More importantly, the threat of war opened up many opportunities. Maybe it was time to make some new alliances. Onoki could not make the first move, of course. Konoha and Suna would have to go to him. His ninja wouldn't like it. Their pride is still hurt from the last war. Anoki could understand this, but pride was like anything else to a shinobi. It was useful until it wasn't anymore, and then it was ruthlessly thrown out. A loose alliance with Suna and Konoha could be profitable. That would stop Ai in his tracks. It would also give Anoki time, time to train Kuritsuchi and plan his escape. His old bones had gotten used to rest. But it was a luxury, and if war was a better option for Iwa, he would take it. That was his job, his burden. His most loyal ANBU kneeled beside his desk. He must have been confused, but he hid it well. Itachi was one of the best shinobi that Konoha had ever produced. It was both a source of pride and shame for Haruzen. Itachi could have been the first Uchiha Hakage if not for so many things and so many decisions. If only he'd been more determined when dealing with Danzo, and if only he hadn't let the Uchiha go off on their own. If only, nothing could change what happened, which was both obvious and true. But since he quit, Haruzen has had so much more time to think. No, don't think, process. To come to terms with the whole of his second term as Hakage. His opinion would be that it had failed. The Uchiha, Hisashi Hyuga, Orochimaru and Naruto. He had strained his relationship with Kakashi, who was another possible Hakage that Haruzen had failed to help. He had broken up with Jiraiya. If he hadn't unintentionally made Jiraiya want his approval, Haruzen knows Jiraiya would have stopped talking to him or ignored his orders. So many bad choices or, even worse, situations led him to think he had no choice at all. Taburama had been very harsh in his short speech, and Haruzen could see the disappointment in the man's eyes. Haruzen shook himself out of his thoughts so he could hear Itachi's final report. Speak, Itachi Kun. Sandame Sama, as you asked, I found out where that large group of Odo Shinobi went, Itachi said. Haruzen made sure there were people in Odo who could report on their movements. When he heard that dozens of people were being sent to the same place, he knew his student was up to something. When I got there, I found dozens of Odo ninja dead from different wounds. From the looks of the battle, it seemed like they were fighting only one person. I saw what seemed to be the remains of poisonous gases coming from the bodies. I continued my investigation of the mountain's graveyard and came to a few conclusions when I finished my search. And who are they? I think the place was a base for the man who called himself Madara. He was the one who recruited me and killed most of the Achiha. I think Orochimaru found out about his base and ordered an attack. I also think she knew enough about him to know those ninja were marching to their deaths, so she gave them something to eat that would kill them if they got hurt. Since the alleged Madara was not there, I do not know if his body was there. So, she might have a fully functional sharing in. It's possible, yes. This this is not good, Haruzen whispered. He wasn't the type to panic, but this was the worst thing that could happen. With all due respect, Sandame Sama, I disagree. Madara was both cruel and strong. He never gave me a chance to kill him, or I would have. If Orochimaru was able to subdue or kill him, that is for the best. Maybe so, Itachi Kun, but we don't know what she wants. Her having a sharing and I fear what she could do with such a power, what she will do. If she got good enough, she might be able to control Naruto Kun. As Kakashi Sensei has shown, implanting a sharing and has its downsides. Also, I think her motivations are pretty clear. As I've already said, she seems to be grooming Naruto-kun to be her lover. That's why she's been so interested in his growth. However, given her personality, she wouldn't stand for being second to him. 
Haruzen replied. The problem with that is that Naruto is talented, but he hasn't shown anything that should make him a rival to her. Maybe in a few years with just the quantity, but a large number of original ninjutsu wouldn't justify it because she has a large number of her own, he said. Itachi debated whether he should break this law or not. He thought the Sandame needed a clear picture so he wouldn't keep obsessing when it wasn't necessary. He had a lot of respect for the man, but he could see that his need to see Orochimaru as the worst villain was going to get him into trouble. Sandame sama Are you aware that Naruto-kun can use lava release? The question stunned Haruzen. On top of everything else, Naruto-kun had a Keke Genkai. No, I didn't know that he had a bloodline. He doesn't, Itachi responded. Naruto doesn't have the Hayat and Keke Genkai, but I've seen him use Jutsu for both lava and snow when there wasn't any lava or snow around. This is what I didn't want to tell you, Sandame sama Naruto has found a way to use sub-elements without having a natural affinity for them. Everything inside the former Hakage wanted to say no to what Itachi said. He had tried to do the sub-elements himself after looking at his combination method. It wasn't easy, and very, very few shinobi could do it. It was hard to believe that a boy could do what he hadn't been able to do. But he knew Itachi to be honest and wouldn't say this if he wasn't sure. It would make Itachi's argument make sense. But Haruzen was now more interested in how Naruto had managed to hide it for so long. Someone must have known, and word would have spread. How did such a big accomplishment go unreported? Was Naruto really so alone that no one could even spare a moment to see how amazing he was? No, someone had to know and keep it a secret. The Sandam remembered the mission debriefing when Team 7 and 8 came back from the Land of Snow. Kakashi and Kuranai had hidden it well, but they were trying not to say anything, and Kakashi didn't let his students be there, as if he was afraid one of them would spill the beans. Kakashi used to be one of his most trusted agents. Had he turned him against him to this point? He stopped the train of thought because now was not the time to think about guilt. He had to think because this added a new twist. Even if Itachi was right and Orochimaru's goals didn't go beyond her interest in Naruto-kun, she would still want to become more powerful if she could keep up with his growth. At least now he could tell Kabuto what to look for and how to report it. Thank you, Itachi-kun, for everything. Since Tsunade is now the Hokage, this will be your last job for me. As always, you have kept up your enviable level of excellence. Please continue to make the leaf proud, my boy. Thank you, Sandame sama Itachi said before disappearing in a shunshin. Naruto rushed into the academy building, with Magula right behind him. He took longer than he thought to finish his project because he wanted to catch the core before class. He hoped Haruka wouldn't mind too much, but he couldn't wait until their classes were over because he would already be gone. As Naruto walked through the halls, nothing about them reminded him of his time at the academy. When he got to the classroom he wanted, he knocked three times and waited for someone to answer. Come in, Aruka said, and was surprised to see Naruto standing there in his chunin uniform. Naruto, can I help? Hi, can I quickly talk to Konohamaru, Yudon, and Mogi? Class is in session. You'll have to wait. Mizuki spat and watched as Naruto just barely acknowledged his presence before ignoring it entirely. The red-haired Yuzumaki looked back at Aruka and waited for him to reply. Both the teachers and some of the students noticed the blow-off. Usually, I'd agree, but if you're here, it must be for a reason, so they can leave, but please hurry. As the three of them walked to the hall, Naruto said, Thank you, Aruka. Naruto quietly closed the door behind him while the tree waited. Naruto said, Hey, guys. I'm sorry I had to pull you out of class for this, but I don't have a lot of time. Konohamaru asked, Boss, are you going on an important mission? Mogi asked, Are you going to rescue another princess? Yudan prodded, Or overthrow a corrupt government? Sorry, I can't do that. I'm going on a training trip for a few years and won't be back in the village until it's over. What? They shouted, making Naruto and Magula jump because of how loud it was. As she rubbed her ears, the panther said, I owe you, and Naruto had to agree. Don't be so loud, idiots. I'll be leaving the village for a while, so I wanted to leave you all something to help you train. Naruto pulled out three medium-sized scrolls, one black, one blue, and one red, and gave them to Konohamaru, Mogi, and Yudon, in that order. In those scrolls are training guides that I made for each of you. You don't have to follow them exactly, they're just there to help. If your interests change, though, I think you'll find some useful information there. Thanks, boss, said Konohamaru as his two friends joined him for a hug. Naruto gave his little friends hugs and told them he'd be back around the time of their graduation. He was excited to see how much they had grown. The core gave Magila hugs, and then they all went back to class. Both Summoner and Summons left, because they had a lot of people to see today, and needed to make up for lost time. After leaving the academy, they used Shunshin to get to their next destination, where they saw Shikamaru and Shino waiting for them. 
You're late, Shikamaru observed. Yes, I think you lost track of time because you were geeking out, Shino said. At what Aburane said, Naruto got a tick. I wasn't geeking out, and that's hardly a conclusion. You just guessed, Titabeo. Shino said, but I'm right. Shikamaru stopped his teammates as he walked by and said, We don't have time for this, you two troublemakers. You know, Shino, sometimes I think Shika doesn't like us. I, too, get a very cold reception. Do you think we are the only ones? It seems unlikely. So you could say he has maybe lost that loving feeling. You both need to stop talking. It may be gone. Gone, gone, Shino said, ignoring Shikamaru. I'm going to warn you both. Now he's criticizing the small things we do. I want to cry because, baby, something beautiful is dying, she said. You two will never take me to karaoke again. Naruto said, but Shika, you are great. Who knew you had the voice of an angel? Shino said, I'd guess Temori, which made Shikamaru get a tick mark. It was just a guess. When are you going to show Teuya your special skills, Shino? If the question itself wasn't surprising enough, the fact that it came from Kirinai made it even more so, since the boys hadn't noticed her arrival. When she could only hear a faint buzzing, she laughed. Shikamaru soon joined in, savoring the reversal. Naruto was quiet as he waited to see if and when it was his turn. Kirinai saw Naruto's eager body language and just smiled at him while stroking his cheek. He turned away and blushed, probably thinking how unmanly it was for him to do something like that. The team sat down at the place where they trained together for the first time as a team. It was strange to miss something that had happened a year ago, but Kirinai couldn't help herself. When she took on this team, she didn't really know what to expect. A part of her worried that three teenage boys wouldn't want a woman as their sensei, or would be too happy about it for the wrong reasons. That hadn't happened, and she was happy about that. We don't have much time left, but I just wanted to say that I can't imagine having a better group of students. Each of you has made me very proud in the short time we've been together. I'll admit I'm sad that one of you will be leaving for so long. I know Juri Asama is your godfather and a powerful ninja, but I want more time for us to be a team. We'll always be a team, sensei, because our ties can't be broken so easily. Shino, you're right. We didn't come together quickly or easily, but you all overcame problems and have the potential to be one of the best teams Konoha has ever seen. Shikamaru and Shino, I know I'll still be your captain, but I wanted to tell you all my thoughts before Naruto left. Shikamaru, you have a mind that blows me away, and I have no doubt that one day you will be smarter than your father. But you are not just your mind. You are more than that, and you can be more. I'm glad you found the motivation to do more than just look at everything from every angle and choose the easiest way. I know most of the world must bore you, but I'm glad you've decided to challenge yourself Shikamaru just nodded because he didn't know what else to say. Shino, your clan is often alone because of your allies and your logical way of thinking. I'm glad you were able to open up to us and had faith we wouldn't reject you. Seeing more and more of your personality come to the fore has been a treat and I look forward to what other sides you reveal in the coming years. You are a very interesting young man. Shino didn't say anything, but Kirinai heard a faint buzzing and knew what it meant. Now, my troubled child. Hey, you didn't want to be on a genin team because you thought it was an insult, and you weren't wrong. I'm sorry I didn't see through the Sandames games that he was using us to cover up his crimes, but I'm glad you were on this team in the end. I'm afraid that if you hadn't been on this team, you would have come to believe that no one in Konoha could be trusted. You would have left, which would have. But you see it now, even if you don't fully trust it yet. You're winning over more and more of the village. They're seeing Naruto use Yumaki for who he is and not what he has. You fought and fought and fought, and now you're free of the Kyuubai's shadow. I'm sure you'll grow under Jiraiya guidance. Samas just don't have so much fun that you don't want to. Naruto just nodded when his sensei spoke, glad that Majula broke the silence by asking Kurenai to talk about her as the unofficial fifth member of Team 8. Her pleading was so cute that even Shikamaru laughed, which was even less common than Shino laughing. Kirinai picked up the cub, rubbed her head, and said some very heartfelt things about how the team couldn't work without Majila's help. The panther was soaking up all the attention and looked very pleased with herself. Overall, teammates' last meeting went well. Kiba fell hard, and a dull thud could be heard all over the training ground. Akamaru barked in anger because he didn't like how his partner was being treated. Sasuke ignored it and just waited for Kiba to stand back up. It was taking longer than it should have, and he hadn't hit the Inuzuka all that hard. Would you chill out, you idiot? Kiba yelled from the ground, refusing to get up. Sasuke thought for a moment about whether or not to kick him, but then he did. You've been a real piece of work ever since that mission with Team 8, Kiba kept saying. So, weren't you embarrassed? Weren't you ashamed? A team the same age as us fought as class ninja and won with no permanent injuries. What the hell have we been doing because it's not what they've been doing? 
Sasuke had a lot of pride, and it hurt when Kakashi told them to stop, but more than that, he was inspired. Clearly, he and his team could do better if they worked harder, smarter, and better. That Naruto kid is a weirdo, so you can't compare them. He was a genin like us, Sasuke observed. Yes, and my clan thinks it's because the sand name had it out for him for some reason. He was only a genin in name, Kakashi sensei would agree. The three members of Team 7 looked at their sensei reading in a tree, not the least bit concerned about what they were doing. But Naruto didn't fight them by himself. Kurenai sensei put her whole team in Naruto's hands, Sakura said. But Shikamaru is a freakishly smart guy, and Shino isn't too far behind. When you add them to the kid who can make lava come out of the ground. Ma, 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 Kibakun. The trees have ears, so you shouldn't talk about things so casually, right? Kakashi said in a light tone, but Kiba heard the threat. They had all been told not to tell anyone about Naruto's lava release, because it would make Naruto's trump card less effective if everyone knew about it. Besides, one jutsu doesn't make you ready to fight an S-class ninja, Sasuke said. Kakashi, you need to teach us better. As you are now, each of you could easily pass another chunin test. That doesn't work. Sasuke-kun, don't put yourself in someone else's shadow so quickly. The Uchiha took offense to that. I'm not, I just see what could happen. No, you don't. When you and Naruto both went to the academy, most people thought you were better at the shinobi arts than Naruto would ever be, Kakashi said. But, Naruto had to go his own way because he had to. If he'd been forced to follow the rules, it would have killed his potential when it was young. The hawk sees no more potential in the shark than the shark sees in the hawk. Your path is different, and if you work hard you will grow, Sasuke. Don't limit yourself by making comparisons you don't understand. Kakashi sent his team home for the day and told his troublemaker to think about what he said. Sasuke took the scenic way back to his house, trying to figure out what had happened. He knew that people had different skills, but what Kakashi said about Naruto made no sense. He would have struggled in the academy, but was he good enough to graduate early? It was contradictory. Your sensei is right, a disembodied voice said amongst the trees. Sasuke got nervous because he hadn't noticed that someone was following him, and he still couldn't feel anyone around him. Sharingan turned on, and Sasuke asked, who's there? He quickly pulled out a kanai and took a defensive stance. Someone very old. Old enough to have seen the beginning of your clan and to have served it for generations. I only come out when needed, and as the last member of your clan, I am needed. Sasuke couldn't believe what he'd heard. There was no way someone could be that old. He knew it was impossible, but he didn't want to insult a possible enemy he couldn't find, so he decided to play along. If what you say is true, I am the last of my clan and have been for a long time. Wrong. There was another, but he died. Itachi was the only traitor. Who? Madara-sama survived his fight with Hashirama, but he lived alone. He thought day and night about how he could save his clan and people, but he ran out of time as he got older. What do you mean by save us? The Senju found strength in bonds, and they spread that idea throughout Konoha. The Uchiha found strength in solitary trials, where each person pushed himself or herself to the limit. Madara thought the Senju way was weakening the Uchiha, and Itachi proved him right. You are the most talented of your generation, but you are outclassed by a Hyuga and an Uzumaki, which is essentially a Senju clan because they were cousin clans. So, how do I get stronger and live up to my full potential? Keep learning as much as you can from your friends. I'll be in touch, and everything will come out in the end. Stay strong, Sasuke-sama. What are your initials? You may call me Zetsu, my lord. He went to her house by himself and let Majula stay at the Uzumaki estate until it was time to leave. He could have just sent her back to her country, but he knew she'd like to be spoiled one last time by Karin and Teuya before the trip. Baruto wasn't surprised when Kabuto opened the door and showed how fakely happy he was. He didn't know why he thought it was a fake, but he did, and he didn't trust Orochimaru's longtime subordinate. He never said anything about his worries because they weren't based on anything, but he was always careful around the medic and never let the shinobi with glasses stay behind him. Kabuto didn't take long to show Naruto where his old Shishu was, and then he quickly left, wishing Naruto safe travels. Naruto didn't think he meant a word of it, but he didn't have anything else to do. Well, this is a pleasant surprise, she said as she worked hard at her desk with a smile on her face. And what brings my former student here? Naruto just looked at her, wondering what her plan was this time. She liked playing games, and it seemed like she really liked making him the target. Usually, it was just a little bit embarrassing. Even with all the hormones that come with puberty, if he didn't stop her now, it would only get worse. I had some things I needed to say before I left, Titebeo, Naruto said as he took a green line scroll out of his holster. I spent most of my time alone. Training helped me forget that feeling, to run away from it. 
It helped me get stronger and gave me something to be proud of. But I couldn't have done it without your help. I don't know why you sent those scrolls to me in the first place, and I don't care. Everyone else who could have helped me was too afraid of the old man to do so. More than just training me, they made me feel like someone cared about me. Someone noticed me and wanted to help, and that often meant more than what I learned. Then you helped me find my mother and learn about my past. Because of you, I have a real family and a clan. You even trained me to survive against the Akatsuki, which I doubt I could have done without your help. I don't know why you did it, but I don't care. I'll always be thankful for what you've done for me, and I don't know how to repay you fully. But I hope this can be a start the scroll was set on her desk by Naruto. This is everything I've thought about chakras and how they work, it's my chakra theory. It's not much, but I thought you might like to see what your help led to. After he was done talking, he just wanted to turn and run away because he felt strange and worried. It shouldn't have been a big deal, but every serious jutsu creator has their own theories about why things work. The insights grew over time, and it's not just a look at how they see chakra, it's often a look at how they see the world. They tend to be more philosophical than scientific, so he was sharing a very important part of himself. Even people who teach students rarely give them all of the information they have learned. Instead, they only show them the way. Orochimaru knew what the gesture meant, maybe even more than Naruto himself. Her maelstrom never stopped surprising her, and for a change, she didn't make fun of it or do anything else to dull the emotion. She got up quickly and gracefully and moved around her desk until she was next to Naruto. She gently rubbed his whiskered cheek. She said softly, thank you, Naruto, and the boy just nodded. She soon took her hand away, and they missed each other for a moment. You know, after three years I'll expect you to have improved a lot. I know, and hopefully in height, she added, and she saw a brief flash of irritation in his eyes. Seriously, Naruto, I want to fight you when you get back. I promise I won't have gotten weaker while you were gone. Naruto smiled as he looked at his former master and said, that's fine. I'll win no matter what. Oh, you don't just have to impress me, you have to win outright. That sounds like a bet-worthy statement. I'm so sure of it that we don't even need to talk about the rules. Some people would say that making a blind bet, which means I can make you do anything I want if you lose, is stupid. Maybe, but I trust you, and besides, I'm not going to lose, Titebeo. Hyukuku, I look forward to it, Orochimaru said. Soon, she got a warning that someone was at the door. She knew who it was and swore at the Lumox for being so slow. She gave Naruto a sign to follow her, and the two of them walked toward the door. When they got there, Juria was there with two backpacks to meet them. Juria said to his fellow Sanon, I figured you'd be here, Gaki. Come on, we're wasting daylight. Yes, yes, Naruto said before turning to Orochimaru and giving her a quick hug. I'll see you in three years, Shishu. Be ready to make good on our bet. Kyukuku, make sure you do the same, he told her. She watched as her godfather and godson left the village and went somewhere else. Once she was free, Orochimaru went back to her study and went straight for the bookcase behind her desk. She took out a book called The Way of Tea and broke a seal inside it to open a door to a secret passageway. As Orochimaru walked into the hall, the door shut behind her and the lights turned on. She soon found a hatch and went down into a sub-basement that only she knew about. When she got to the bottom and stood in her most secret lab, the room that had been dark started to light up. All the usual things for a lab were there, but the white zetsu suspended in larger glass chambers and kept alive by a liquid mixture were the most important additions. Two sharing and eyes were put away to be used later. Last, Madara lay helpless on a metal table with his one remaining arm and both legs tied to it. Karin knew it was Abaido Achiha because she had done a blood test on him. His chakra closed because now was not the time to be proud. She climbed on top of the man and smiled evilly as she did so. She could have killed him easily, but something about him interested her. He was part of the chain of events that led Naruto to her. If Minato and Kushina had raised him, he would have been a different, probably less interesting person. She leaned forward and put her forearms on his chest, which held her up and made him carry her weight. He grunted, which was the only sign that he was awake and aware. I'm curious, Abaido-kun, she said, pausing to watch his reaction. From the grimace on his face, she knew he didn't like being called by his name. Was making a deal with me really so bad? Was giving me what I want so bad that you couldn't even think about it? I wonder if it's a flaw of your gender that you gain great power, and then ignore any woman in your way. Kane did that, and Conan. No deal would have been kept. If you hadn't come for me, that boy would have taken care of me with your help if you hadn't. Fair enough, Kyukyuko. I was never going to let you take the Kyuubai from Naruto-kun, but your outright refusal hastened your downfall. It was because I didn't kill you right away. So, why did you do it? Why killed your sensei? I don't care what happens. Just kill me. Don't be in such a hurry, Obito-kun. 
Your end will come soon enough, but only after my curiosity has been satisfied. As day turns to night, time passes. Naruto and Jiri are laid around a fire in a remote clearing in the Land of Fire. After a long day of saying goodbyes, the Uzumaki were winding down. Tsunade Obachan, Shizune Nichin, and Hinata were all there to see them off. Hinata even gave him a letter to read sometime in the future. Jiria and he didn't talk much while traveling because they chose to move quickly on their first day. Jiria looked like he was really thinking about what he wanted to say to his godson. During their training trip, they had to do more than just make Naruto stronger. He wanted to get to know Naruto well enough to be at least a little bit as close to him as he was to Minato. He wanted to do a lot for the young man and show him a world without violence and betrayal. He couldn't ignore the fact that Naruto might be in danger, though, so that was where he had to start. Naruto, yes, pervy wise man. First, stop calling me that, or at least don't do it around any pretty women. I agree with that. So, what's going on? Well, kid, I have bad news. The Keizkage plan to use information about you to blackmail Konoha into a better alliance agreement. When he was killed, that information was sent to the other three major nations. Nothing is happening right now, but we are in a state of cold war while we wait to see what Kumo and Iwa do. He saw as Naruto fell over. Isn't there always something? People hate and fear your dad because he was too good at what he did. There's too much hatred in this world in general. I've wanted to do something about it for a long time but haven't been able to. Maybe you can figure it out if I fail. Sure, it's not like that's too much to ask, Naruto said with a roll of his eyes. Yes, it is. This is the most ambitious goal a shinobi could have, even more so than becoming Hokage. But what else do you have to do? What do you think that means? What do you want to achieve, Naruto? To be the strongest shinobi in Konoha and the best ninjutsu creator ever. Well, you've done the first one, and by the end of this trip, you'll be damn close to the second. Congratulations. Is that it? Seems kind of empty for someone like you. You can't be in charge of a place where people hate you. They don't hate you anymore, Naruto. But they'll never throw you a parade or apologize as a group. It's not fair, it's not right, but it's the truth. Many of them have changed their minds, and they may even realize they were always wrong and feel bad. But they won't say so. So what? Now that no one is staring at me, we're even. I know it's not perfect, but it's a lot worse than less than perfect. What if I don't agree? You say they won't admit they were wrong, but what if they didn't have a choice? So you're going to scare people who aren't as strong as you. I thought you were better than that. They sure as hell didn't mind scaring me when I was weaker than them. And you don't know a fucking thing about me. You could have, but you let an old man convince you to break your promise and leave me, so don't act like you know anything about me. Naruto, that sounds like a plan for revenge. No, that's fair. They should be punished for mistreating a child. They should have to face what they did and own it, just like I have to. I can't act like my childhood wasn't what it was. You could be better, though. Yes, the old man used to tell me that nonsense every day while lying to my face. Imagine how convincing it is coming from the man who left me alone. Jiria really wanted to know, and as Naruto shrugged, she asked, Do you hate me for not being there? Just because you cared about my father doesn't mean you care about me. I'm guessing you didn't think being a godfather would amount to much. So when the worst happened it was easier to obey the old man. You did your thing, I did mine. I don't hate you because I didn't even know you existed, but I'm pissed. Why? Are you going to tell me I shouldn't be? No, this is good, we need to clear the air. You're right, I wasn't there, and I didn't think being a godfather would require much. Contrary to what you think, listening to Sensei wasn't easy at all. I was the failure of my team, Naruto. I was a late bloomer surrounded by geniuses, and because my skills came out late, our roles were set by the time I started matching Orochi and Tsunade. As for the villagers, I know it may not feel good to just forgive them, like they get away with it even though they weren't totally to blame Jiraiya said this when he saw that Naruto was about to speak up. They are ultimately responsible for what they did. From what I know, the Kyuubai attack was terrible beyond imagination, a widespread trauma with no outlet until your status was revealed. I blame Sensei for that. He should have been a stronger leader, a beacon of hope to lead them through. Instead, he played the kind grandfather when he was capable of more. One reason Orochi couldn't be Hokage was because she didn't inspire people. You can. You can show them grace, Naruto. You can show them what it means to endure and come out better, stronger, and smarter for it. I'm only asking you to show the villagers the same Naruto that the people of Konoha know. What if I can't do it? Part of the reason for our training trip is to give you time away to come to terms with everything and find peace within yourself. You still see them as an extension of Sensei. 
How are you able to know that? I've talked to Kirinai and Orochimaru, and I've been following your progress, Naruto. I can't promise anything. And why is it so important that I forgive them? Because Naruto, I think the only people who can really break this cycle of hatred are those strong enough to stand against the logic of this world. Like you. So this was it for today. I will continue this series in next part. Till then, we weave offline.